Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, three-hour webinar on a Saturday afternoon in the, on the East Coast and later, much, much later in other parts of the world or very early in the morning. Um, the, um, I will not cover everything that is in this, uh, these notes. As, as you notice, there's uh, about 200 pages of notes. But I, I, want, I don't want you necessarily to, to write about it because I'm going to send you the notes. I will, you, everybody will have these notes. I will, I will put it on our website so you could download the notes um, probably later today. So what I would request is that you listen, you try to understand, and all the notes will be supplied to you later. So this is the table of content. Uh, we're going to start with the historical evidence of homeopathy in times of it, epidemic. And then we're going to talk about the COVID specifically, the perfect storm, complicating factor, and so on. And we're going to end up with the, uh, well, with case management, rather the, um, you know, the like clinical approach and and with the, the, the main remedies. Okay, very good. So let's start with the hysterical approach, uh, the hysterical uh, evidence. So this is very similar to the what I presented before the American Institute of Homeopathy last Wednesday. Uh, <clears throat> likely the most compelling evidence for the effectiveness of homeopathy is found in an ex extensive record in times of epidemics. The homeopathic literature is very rich in rep reports on the result obtained by the homeopathic treatment during times of epidemic as close to 10,000 reference have so far been found. The main finding of this review is that the result obtained by homeopathy during epidemic consistently reveal an extremely low mortal mortality rate. This observation holds true regardless of the physician, the time, the place, or the epidemic disease. Including disease that are known to have a very high mortality rate, such as cholera, smallpox, diphtheria, typhoid fever, yellow fever, and pneumonia. I will now present a few striking example to illustrate the constancy of astonishing low mortality rate. It is well recognized that infectious disease have often made more casualty among armies than combat and have thus shaped the destiny of nation more than any other factor, including the best generals or the best army. Napoleon left France in June 2000, uh, 1812 to conquer Russia with 600,000 soldiers and only 3,000 of these were still alive one year later. It is estimated that he lost close to 220,000 soldiers solely to epidemic typhus in his first campaign to conquer Russia. In 1813, in a second attempt to conquer Russia, Napoleon retreated with his army to the city of Leipzig, where he was surrounded by the Allied armies and where the largest battle in European soil would occur prior to World War I, what became known as the Battle of the Nation. Nations. Incidentally, Dr. Samuel Anneman, the founder of Homeopathy, was living in Leipzig during its siege in the fall of 1813. Typhus became dust epidemic in Leipzig and every physician was obliged by the authorities to be in charge of a makeshift hospital to treat its population infested with epidemic typhus. In general, mortality from typhus tends to exceed 15%, but can be much higher, even up to 100% in a famished and stressed population, as it was the case in Leipzig during its siege. In his makeshift hospital, Anneman treated 
183 cases without losing a single case, while the mortality under the ordinary treatment was considerable. Arnman wrote, of 183 cases treated by me in Leipzig, not one died, which created a great sensation among the Russian, then ruling in Dresden, but was consigned to oblivion by medical authorities. Oh, Peter, can you hear me? I can, yes, Andre. Uh, apparently people cannot hear me, so that means they have a problem with their, their sound. No, they, they, they mute their microphone, their own microphone. Okay, sorry, I was interrupted. Um, when, okay, let's go back. Uh, when cholera entered Europe uh, for the first time in 1831, Hahnemann predicted what, which remedy would be indicated for the different stage of the disease. His prediction turned out to be true, and millions of people benefit from his advice, as in all parts of the world that were visited by cholera for the succeeding decades and, and where homeopathy was applied, Homeopathy came out with flying colors by decreasing the death rate from an average of about 50% to down to 1% or 2%. In a well-documented uh, uh, well uh, epidemic of cholera that occurred in Cincinnati in 1849, two homeopathic physicians published daily in the public press the outcome of their treatment, which brought national attention. By the end of the epidemic, they had treated 2,646 cases with 35 deaths, a mortality rate of 1.3, while allopathy, the conventional medicine, had lost, according to the report of the Board of Health, nearly one half of their case. These truly extraordinary results were obtained despite the fact that a fair number of patients were in a deep state of collapse, as well as many other who had been mismanaged by practitioner of the conventional school of medicine. A third example, during the middle part of the 19th century, a most violent form of scarlet fever, known as malignant scarlet fever, affected many community in the eastern part of America, where it became the leading cause of death among children. In Carlisle, Pennsylvania, the homeopathic physician Adolf Lippe, reporting having treating in 1849, over 150 cases of malignant scarlet fever without a single death. While the death rate under conventional medicine was over 90%, and the survivors were crippled for life. Such results are truly extraordinary considering the fact that malignant or septic scarlet fever is the most severe and usually fatal form of scarlet fever where infection become overwhelming, leading to septicemia, secretary collapse, shock, and total organ failure, with some patient being described as rotting alive. The fourth example is about an epidemic of malignant diphtheria that affected large community on the eastern seashore of the United States between 1859 and 1862. Three homeopathic physicians in Philadelphia reported having treated over close to 300 of fully developed cases of malignant diphtheria without a single death in the winter of 1860, while the mortality under conventional medicine was over 50%. The least we could say is that these few examples of the extraordinary result obtained by homeopathy in times of epidemic are powerful illustration of a remark made by Nobel Prize uh, Nobel laureate Sir Ernest Rutherford, if your experiments need statistics, you ought to have done a better experiment. Let's now focus on the current COVID-19 epidemic, a flu-like illness that is precisely the subject of this webinar. When people die from the flu or flu-like illness, 98% of these die from pneumonia. Despite all the advance made in conventional medicine, pneumonia remains a major cause of morbidity and mortality, even in developed countries. Globally, pneumonia kills nearly one million 
uh, children every year, uh, younger than five years old each year, more than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combi combined. The World Health Organization estimates that in developing country, one in three children die from, a, die from or associate with acute respiratory tract infection. We will therefore focus our attention on the outcome of the comparative treatment of the pneumonia patient. All cohorts of five or more cases that could be found in the conventional and homeopathic literature on the outcome of patient with pneumonia in a mixed population of ambulatory and hospitalized care during the same period of time in the same part of the world have been tabulated here. Hey, Andre, let me interrupt you for one second. Yes. We've got a few people that are reporting that uh, the, the page, when they log in, is telling them the organizer has muted the audio. Um, and so I don't know. I, I mean, obviously, I'm hearing you, and I'm, I'm seeing from others that are watching, listening, that, that they can hear you. So it's it seems to be just in a few cases. Yeah. Uh, it, I, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I I don't know. It's probably their um no, I I'm not I mean they're muted. Everybody's mute. They in other words we cannot hear them. But the I cannot mute myself for just a few people. So it's a problem with their computer or their yeah, um, no, they, it may be it may be for folks that are having difficulty, uh they want to try a different browser as well. It could be your browser that's causing your problem. Yeah, absolutely. It could be a browser. So Chrome seems to work better for uh the go to webinar uh, meeting platform. Okay, thank you. So I cannot um, mute myself for just a few people. So, it... yeah, please continue. We're all set. So, here, if we look at the comparative mortality from community acquired pneumonia, so we're excluding hospital acquired pneumonia or, or yeah, hospital because the mortality would be much higher. Under uh, pre-antibiotic allopathy, expectancy, that means uh, just a good uh, watch, watch and uh, wait and watch without treatment. So people here are, are well-fed, hydrated, kept in a good uh, air room. Um, this is conventional, current conventional care. Homeotherapeutics, that means way of applying the law of similar, but not maybe always according to the direction of Hahnemann, which would be called genuine homeopathy, Hahnemann and homeopathy, so we see. So here, under pre-antibiotic allopathy, we see that the mortality was 24.3. This is according to my records of looking at the literature. Osler uh, said it's, it, it's about 30%, so he has uh, maybe different, uh, no, because he limited his view to certain certain uh, statistic, but if you look at all the statistics, it's closer to 23, 24.3. Expectancy, there were four studies, three or four studies, they've done at different places, and they all came around 21%, all three studies. So it seems to that either that uh, com the conventional care at the time either um, hurt people, uh, they, they like three percent of people were hurt by by the conventional care. Today, uh, in um, for community acquired pneumonia, the latest uh, meta analysis show uh, uh, a uh, mortality rate of thirteen point seven percent. That means in some groups, like the children, maybe it's it's quite low, maybe one or two percent, but in the elderly, it's very high. So on average, it's thirteen point seven percent. In homeotherapeutics, that means all form of applying the law of similars, the mortality is quite better than modern conventional care, 3.4. And under general animanian homeopathy, it's almost like perfect. It's close to zero. Quite astonishing. Now, let's look at the odds of surviving community acquired pneumonia under these uh, different uh, approach. So in pre-antibiotic allopathy, the odds of surviving is 3 to 1. With Today, with current conventional care, is 6 to 1. With homeotherapeutics, 
it would be 20, it was, or it, it can be 28 to 1. And with genuine Anamanian homeopathy, it's two, 239 to 1. Quite a difference. Now, let's look specifically at the 1918, <clears throat> 1920 influenza pandemic, also known as the Spanish flu, and that was associated with an estimate of 50 to 100 million deaths worldwide. An estimate of 670,000 um, American, or 0.7% of the U.S. population, died from influenza during this pandemic, 10 times as many as World War I, and even more deadly than the American casualty in World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam War combined. So an estimated 43,000 service persons mobilized for World War I die from influenza or half of the American soldier who died in Europe during World War I. This table show a comparison of the result reported by homeopathic physician during the fall and winter of 1918-1919. Uh, 1918, winter of 1919, which was the most de deadly phase. And here too, this was the most deadly, the fall of 18. And here we have the the um, the most deadly with the second most deadly, the, the winter of 1919. So here, uh, there were many, um, there were many reports by the US Army and I took the one with the lowest mortality. So there were some were maybe seven and eight percent death rate among patients that people that the combined effect of influenza and pneumonia. So I took the one with the lowest to to compare with homeopathy. Homeopathy was done in the general population. This was done with young people, strong and so on here with old, young babies, pregnant women, no pregnant women here. So the fact that the the death rate was um, seven times uh, less was or eight times less was quite remarkable, and this was again was not genuine homeopathy but um, homeotherapeutics. Now, if we look at pregnant women, which uh, was a segment of the population that was the most affected during the Spanish flu, the difference is uh, even more striking here. Of the of the women that were pregnant that had the flu and or pneumonia, 30% of them died. So 30% of people that got the flu died under conventional medical care, while under homeopathy was very, very low, less than 1%. So quite dramatic difference between the two groups. Now, if we look at the odds of uh of for pregnant women to develop pneumonia under conventional care. There was one to one. If you if you recall here, you see the number, the percentage of women who developed pneumonia was fifty one percent under allopathy and about ten times less under homeopathy. So the odds of developing pneumonia under conventional care during the the NIP, the that 1918 1920 influenza pandemic, was one to one, while under homeopathy it was seventeen to one. Quite remarkable. Um, well, there's a one table that seems to make it, uh, oh, okay. I'll just mention it. It seems I lost a slide. Yes, I lost a slide. So the, the slide that you don't have, I'll add afterwards was the odds of surviving the combined effect of influenza and pneumonia in pregnant women. So the odds of surviving, uh, in pregnant women. Um, no, the odds of surviving the the not just pregnant women, but also uh, the different population, the armed force, the general population. So the general population uh, of the the general uh, the conventional care under conventional care in the U.S. armed force, the the odds of surviving was sixteen to one. With homeopathy in the general population was one hundred forty one forty eight to one. For conventional medical care in pregnant women, it was two to one. But for homeopathy in pregnant women was 135 to 1. So I'm not sure what happened to the slide, but it does happen that they can dis disappear. When all the confounding factors are examined, including expectancy, different population, different age, different area, 
The result obtained by general homeopathy in the treatment of the pneumonia patient demonstrate that the robust epidemiological and observational evidence clearly establishes cause and effect between the homeopathic treatment and the recovery of health and the saving of lives. Two, the result obtained by homeopathy during epidemics cannot be explained by the placebo effect. Three, the treatment effect of homeopathy is positive. Four, the magnitude of the, of the, of the treatment effect of homeopathy is remarkable. Fifth, homeopathy greatly shortened the duration of the disease and the recovery time without leaving patient weakened by the treatment. Six, homeopathy clearly saves life. 21 lives were saved out of every 100 case of pneumonia in the pre-antibiotic era and 10 lives out of every 100 case of pneumonia would be saved today. Seven, homeopathy offers the safest and best outcome ever demonstrated by any system of medicine for patients with pneumonia and therefore would receive the highest possible recommendation of any intervention for these patients in the perspective of evidence-based medicine. That is 1A, strong recommendation with high quality evidence. Implication. Since society values the saving of life more highly than any other outcome, homeopathy should be the treatment of choice for people with infectious disease. Patients with CIP, combined effect of influenza and pneumonia, should request genuine homeopathic treatment. Clinicians should offer genuine homeopathic treatment to patients with the combined effect of influenza and pneumonia. Policymaker should ensure that homeopathy is adopted as a standard treatment for this population of patients. Before concluding this part of uh, this webinar on the history of homeopathy in times of epidemic, let me say a few brief words on homeoprophylaxis, which is based on 200 years of experience of using homeopathic remedy for the prevention of disease during epidemics. I will illustrate this point by two brief examples. In 1974-75, in there was a major epidemic of meningococcal meningitis that devastated Brazil around uh, Brazil. Around 250,000 became ill, more than 11,000 died, and more than 70,000 people were left with permanent brain damage. In one city, 18,000 children were given one dose of a homeopathic remedy once as a preventive measure. The incidence of meningitis was seven times less in the group that received homeoprophylaxis. And here I'll put a little footnote. This homeoprophylaxis was not uh, optimal because it was given one dose in a very low potency. It was distributed by the army, so they didn't want to go beyond Avocado's number. So it was not like the, the, the full power of homeopathy for homeoprophylaxis. In 2000, a second example, in 2007, Cuba was in the midst of an epidemic of leptocirrhosis. In three high-risk regions with a combined population of 2.4 million persons, 2.1 million received one or two doses of homeoprophylaxis, and the incidence of leptocirrhosis was significantly diminished, down by 84% in the treatment group. Homeoprophylaxis is known to be safe, effective, and cost-effective. In conclusion for this historical segment, infectious disease can greatly alter civilization and shape history. There will always be, um, yeah. there will always be epidemics and humani humanity will always be susceptible to them. Every epidemic is unique and homeopathy is always ready to face such uniqueness regardless of its newness or severity. The fact that the homeopath take cognizance of symptom per se, uh, this is a quote by Aubrey Farrington, 
whether indicative of any known disease or not, enables him to correct the condition before definitive disease results. And still more important, is able to combat new disease that have never been heard of before. Pneumonia, if taken in its inception, may sometimes be aborted. Influenza, or the epidemic later called flu, which creates such havoc among the soldier in the United States camp and in the army overseas, was treated symptomatically with surprising success by the OEPAC physician, while others were absolutely impotent because they did not know what caused the infection, nor did anyone understand the pathology. It's very reminiscent of today. All flu-like illness can evolve into pneumonia, which becomes by far the main cause of mortality from these illnesses. As close to 98% of people dying from these flu-like illness is from pneumonia. The current COVID-19 epidemic is a flu-like illness that severely affects the older and immunocompromised segment of the population. Homeopathy is always ready to face new epidemics like the COVID-19 pandemic, and it shall rise to this challenge in brilliant ways, as it has done repeatedly in the past. The epidemiological evidence clearly shows that homeopathy disclosed a very consistent and strong prophylactic and therapeutic effect in real world long term effectiveness, while is at the same time safe and cost effective and should therefore play a major role in the public health system. Finally, the take home, take home message I want to leave the audience with in this segment of the history of the evidence on the of the history of homeopathy is that no one should ever die from pneumonia under general homeopathic treatment, regardless of the severity of the case or associate comorbidity. As after 40 years of homeopathic practice and having treated over 250 cases with pneumonia with perfect success, despite the fact that a great number of these, of these cases were on the, their deathbed, whether the implicated microorganism was viral, bacterial, or fungal, and regardless of the severity of the illness, the underlying complication, such as immune deficiency, heart failure, kidney failure, lung cancer, or meningitis, or the age of the patient, as in centenarian, left for dying without any more treatment, or in, in patient infected with resistant microorganism. The answer seems to be clear on to whether homeopathy should be tried in these dire times. So the one doctor says, you think we should try homeopathy. And as usual, I will now um, leave this, present, this presentation on the history of the evidence with the, the word of Hahnemann. How insignificant and eridiculous is mere theoretical skepticism in opposition to this unerring, infallible experimental proof? So, Peter, I'm going to stop the, uh, the the PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to see if people actually can hear me. Apparently, no. Uh, let me see. Uh, no, uh, Andre, I've not. Uh... But I think everybody can hear you just fine, so you're you're fine. Oh, maybe many people cannot get in. Not because it's full. Yeah, it's not full. Yeah. Okay, I see. They're not they're not able to get in. I think that's the problem. Everybody's reporting in that they that they're hearing you loud and clear. So. Oh, uh, perfect, perfect. I'm glad to hear. Finally, I get. Uh, I I can uh, relax now. Okay, very good. So, let's let's look at the. Um, like I say, this text, I'm going to give you this text. Hold on. Okay, there we go. So we'll, we'll talk about the perfect storm now. 
we said before every epidemic is different and this is unique it's a unique epidemic and it will be not the last one that we will face and it's not the first one that humanity uh, that has devastated humanity so what's the perfect storm for covid-19 first of all a high reproductive number 2 to 3.28 depending on the study well the common flu is 1.3 that means one person with the flu communicate the flu to 1.3 person but here it's double about. In earlier estimate, the three different methods of calculation, the reproductive number gave 2.44, 2.67, and 4.2 with an average of 3.28. So in March, uh, it was two, down to two. So maybe it, in different region when they do maybe more uh, isolation, it will go down. One thing is known is virus can travel around the world in 24 hours. It's being traced from uh, a farm in China to back to uh, an airport in China, went around the world. Um, just be aware that the more tests are performed, the more individual are found positive. So when countries shows that the very, very low rate of COVID, it doesn't mean that they don't have many cases. It's just this some country have so many tests available or they don't have the, the, the money. So it is thought like, let's say in Canada, for each case that is test positive, there might be about 25% of the population other for each case that are a carrier of the virus. And in other country, like more uh, with less accessibility to test, it may be up to 400 for each case that's Spread. So basically, the virus has spread around the world. It's every country of the world. I looked last night, it was 199 countries. So basically, every country in the world. Second point, asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic viral spreaders. So a large percent of people that are infected are asymptomatic. And these asymptomatic person tend to have a higher, higher viral load, and they, can, they tend to spread the, the virus greater. For instance, on the Princess Margaret, and Princess, uh, Diamond Princess, out of 3,700 people, 634 um, show positive to the test, but uh, 329 did not have any symptom. So that's about 49% here did not have symptom. So these 328, they go in the, in the public and they can spread the virus. And a person can spread the virus for over one month. And the uh, uh, even a, a proportion of the people that have recovered are still carrier of the virus. And it's not known to what degree they can spread it. Um, so here's our more statistics. We can skip that. So this is the difference between this uh, epidemic and the SARS of 2003, because the SARS was only symptomatic person were were infectious so this is a big difference and that's why it spread much more this time than SARS so it's like more perfect as an epidemic so therefore when they test for fever when people come at the airport it's totally useless because half the people that carry the virus don't have any symptom so it's like as if you were trying to um, using a calendar to contain a soup so it goes through the the filter uh, another point is the incubation period for the COVID-19 is 6.4 days. So people, before they get a symptom, it could, on average, 6.4 days could go by and they can spread the virus, the virus to a lot of people. Uh, here it says 7.1, but let's say around 6. So, and before people fill this scenario, it could be five days can go by. and so. People may say, oh, I just have a cold, and they can still spread the virus quite a lot. Also, it's not known at this time if it's biphasic. Biphasic, that means it come back after a quiet time. It seems to, that it's, there are evidence that it is biphasic, um, uh, that uh, people can be infected and reinfected. So in other words, they will show they're positive, they show negative and they come back again positive. So it's it seems like there it could be two phases or more. The half-life of the virus on surfaces or in the air or on surface is several hours. So that's 
much better than the flu, so it's better for the storm. The other problem is the sensitivity of the test. There was two big study about the sensitivity test, and it showed it was 59 and 71 percent. That means 30 to 40 percent of the people are false negative, and with about 21 percent that are false positive. That means 21 percent are told they are positive, but they're negative, and there is 30 to 40 percent of the people say you don't have, you're not carrier, but you have it. So again, even better to spread the uh, the virus around the world. So I'll skip this duration of the illness quite long, so really a long time to over overwhelm the healthcare system and spread the virus again even more. So you can read all about this. The virulence of the the virus is is medium. If you compare to, uh, well, if you compare to uh, with an average mortality of three point four. On March 6th, it was 3.4. In some countries, it's like close to 7, 8, 9, 10 percent. Um, it's hard to know because there's so many active cases uh, that we don't know the outcome. But it is estimated it was 3.4 compared to the 1918-1920 flu, which was uh, which is 36 time 36 percent greater than the 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 NIP, and 34 34 times greater than the typical seasonal flu. So it's quite a lot, but it's not as much as SARS that occurred in 2003. That was 9.6% and much less than MERS, which is called also camel flu. That was um, close to um, the camel flu was 34%. So quite, quite, quite high. So it's not as bad as that. But virologists uh, were aware of the coronavirus that could uh, um, mutate and could, or other uh, strain could uh, be transmitted to humans, and they were aware that it could create a terrible pandemic. There were really uh, um, many, many papers have been published in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years or even 20 years on, since SARS, let's say, quite a lot in the literature, books, and so on. So, yeah, 80% close to 80% of people that are uh, infected have mild or asymptomatic case. So that's good for the spread of the virus. 15% have a severe illness, five are critical. And of these that are critical, 50 to 70% of these will die. Um, so here the lesions start in the peripheral lungs. When it when the lesion in the lungs begin, people are not necessarily aware that it's happening. So that's a problem. They may have no symptom until at some point they have great shortness of breath. And uh, one of the effect of the of the virus or the 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 inflammatory uh, rea uh, reaction is fibrosis of the lung. So people develop fibrosis, it's not painful. Fibrositis of the lung is not a painful process, so people can develop it. And eventually, they suddenly, they feel that short of breath and already it's advanced fibro fibrotic uh, or inflammatory process. Another a recent study showed that renal damage was, the cause, was caused not only by the virus, but by the antiviral drug. So people that have kidney borderline will be affected by uh, this epidemic. Beware also of being overpromised about the soon to come SARS CoV 2 vaccine, as four vaccines for SARS failed to be safe. Essentially, uh, they developed four lines of vaccine, uh, different labs around the world, for a period of over 10 years, and they had to ab be abandoned because what they noticed is the vaccine was relatively safe at first, but when these people came in contact with a coronavirus that would be like a very mild strain, like a type of cold that a kid would get, they would get a fulminant lung inflammation and uh, succumb to this uh, um, condition. And uh, so it was very, very serious. Um, so here that I described this here, uh, the, the, it's been uh, a, so it's a big big problem uh, because uh, modern medicine relies on this and they cannot find the answer to it. 
uh, even over a long period of time. So there was an uh, uh, um, there was a, an editorial in Science of last week or this week where it says um, about not under promising and over the de over delivering. So, so don't say it will come out in a couple of months, but maybe say it will take two years, and maybe if you can uh, come out in one and a half year, you will have over delivered. But it's the it basically it says it's not an easy um, um, it's not an easy task. It is asked for science to develop a vaccine. And a vaccine is not the best thing, also for the immune system, as we will, as uh, they might we will show before, afterwards. Um, yeah, there's different. Uh, uh, there was other uh, coronavirus on the on on the site on, on the horizon, and just that's only one of them now that came around. The there was MERS, there was SARS, there was two other epidemics that occur, but they were contained very local. So there could be much more uh, in the future, especially with more mutation of the virus. Complication factor, people that have uh, heart um, cancer, immune deficiency, uh, heart disease, kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, are more susceptible. People with AC inhibitors for high blood pressure are certainly uh, susceptible as the, the um, so they have reported that the, the the ACE inhibitor enzymes uh, and the SAR virus uh, gain access to the, uh, they use the same enzyme to get access to the cell. So that means people that take ACE inhibitors risk to be um, seriously um, affected by the virus. Uh, regarding um, the vaccine, you have to be very careful. For instance, in, in uh, Guinea-Bissau, Children who received the H1N1 vaccine became more susceptible to unrelated infection. Uh, yeah, influenza vaccine vaccinees have significantly higher susceptibility to coronavirus when compared to unvaccinated uh, individuals. That's just with the the flu. So I will skip this part. You can read it. It's all showed that it's not good news for a vaccine. Is not a very good news when you look at the overall picture, but not everything is bad news, as people that do come in contact with the virus seem to develop natural immunity. So if there's a, if the virus goes around the world two, three, four times, the people that got it the first time will be able will will not need to be probably in isolation again. Um, and the facts to know about uh, epidemic in general and influenza epidemic in particular. Isolation is good to limit the transmission, but how long can a population sustain isolation? Um, as long as there's isolation, you will lower the propagation. But as soon as some people come out of isolation, go in, in the in the travel around the world, the they will somebody will be in contact with the virus because it's everywhere right now. So maybe it will be transmitted like this in. Um, to everyone eventually until there's a general herd immunity. Course of epidemic are not predictable. So there's no flu, two flu epidemic alike. And this is like, uh, yeah, so there's no two flu. So now we know we're dealing with a pandemic everywhere in the world. Uh, what will be the future? Nobody can say. Um, Yugi Berra says, you should never do prediction, especially about the future. Well, I will do one. It will come back in several ways uh, until we have general uh, um, until we have general uh, herd immunity, because um, you know there's a high reproduction number. The pathogen can mutate. Weather will be weather and calamity and war can create a factor here. If we look at the, the NIP, the 1918-1919 flu epidemic, there were four waves. The first one was in the spring, of, uh, spring summer of 1918. The most deadly one was the fall of 1918. The second most deadly was the winter and spring of 1919. And the fourth and last phase uh, wave was in the winter spring of 1920. Laboratory, we can follow the prognosis of people that are affected just with a CBC by looking at neutrophil lymphocyte. Uh, it's cheap. It's easy to do. 
and it's a reliable predictor how well the patient is responding to treatment. If the ratio increases, that means the neutrophil goes up or the lymphocyte goes down, it's a sign of deterioration and vice versa. If the ratio decreases, the patient is doing better. And it, the more it decreases, the better is the prognosis. So what is the experience of the homeopathic community so far? So my experience from reading all the clinical report I could find from the conventional homeopathic literature and contacts with colleagues from around the world, the different manifestations of COVID-19 uh, are getting clearer all the time. I have treated close to 30 cases with flu-like illness in different continents in the last eight weeks, including what looks like COVID-19, and also one positive a case. 60% of the case have responded to Brownia in the last two months. The rest, especially the one with pneumonia, arsenic amalgam, pulsatella, lycopolium, sulfur, lecasis, sambucus. All cases were individualized and all cases uh, um, got better. The last one was, uh, we, we will talk about it, about him a bit later, it was this morning. I got the news this morning. Yeah, so here I, I, I had the patient with a lymphoma, and she developed, uh, like to give you an example, she developed um, um, uh, pneumonia, and she, we don't know, we think it was, because she, she was in the hospital at that time in New York, and we know it's uh, the spread in New York is very, very high. Anyway, she uh, responded to a chronic remedy. Uh, or O2 was 92 when we start treatment last week, at rest, and within one hour after giving one dose, maybe it was 96, and three hours later, after probably another dose was 99, and she slowly recovered after that. Uh, here is, is two cases two elderly person, 87 and 82. They, they developed sudden shortness of breath with, with breath, with uh, fever and weakness, worse from an exertion. They were in a building where there was a case that was uh, uh, a person from Iran that was brought to the hospital. All began earlier that day on the 19th by uh, Brownia 200D, one dose at 10.30 p.m. for each and one dose on waking in the morning. So when I called them the next morning, 90% better, both of them. They had a mild relapse. Both of them had a mild relapse in the afternoon. I should emphasize here there was a lot of weakness. And they were also very worried at weakness. And um, so Brownia was repeated right away for two more doses. And uh, both were better by the evening. Here is a young surgeon. Uh, that's the case that I was talking before. He developed COVID. He's positive for COVID. Um, he developed symptom of fever, shortness of breath, severe headache, etc. cetera. And, but he developed, uh, with this febrile condition, recurrence of low back pain with the need to stretch, um, which is, uh, he always had this, as long as he can remember, when, whenever he has a febrile condition, water tastes bad and, and nightmare. So here he developed uh, like old symptom. So I had to find his chronic remedy. It's not easy because I don't know this person. I never saw him. I mean, I never saw his case before. So I had to do his chronic remedy first. I didn't have the chronic case. And slowly, we tried to find a chronic remedy. And it was Nature Muriaticum that has this uh, water taste bad and nightmares during the heat. And likely, it's his chronic remedy because the last question I asked him, the last two questions I asked him, I said, at first, you told me that you are okay in the sun, but tell me the truth, not the truth. Uh, let's be more precise. You come out of a store, it's noon, it's uh, 27 degrees or uh, let's say 78 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, no, it's more. Uh, 27 is like 80 degrees. And you're, it's full sun, it's summer, there's no shade, and you need somebody. Because at first, he says the sun is not a problem. So I said, how long could you stay in the sun? Oh, it says not a minute. No, I say, why? He says, it's too hot. Oh, okay, so he's worse in the sun. And then I ask you a second question, which was a direct question. Are you a person that is susceptible to herpes? He said, oh, yes. I have herpes three or four times a year. Since when? He says, um, grade eight. So 
um, and he, he started to slowly respond. He was quite, quite weak. His uh, energy was like close to one, even despite being 30 years old. Here is another surgeon. They've left shortness of breath uh, with anxiety, better right away within one hour with one dose of her chronic remedy, which was our Seneca Mabo. So the anxiety here, the weakness and the shortness of it came fairly quickly, but this, I could recognize that it was a chronic remedy. Here is a student that she developed sore throat, weakness, fever, shortness of breath. She thinks she got, she got the uh, COVID because her boyfriend worked in a company. There was a lot of cases and he came home eventually and he became sick and uh, she was not tested, but she responded very quickly to our Here Here's an interesting case because I say, what do you, she lives in the country. I says, what do you have as a place to get a remedy? He said, there's a local pharmacy. So she went and she found only arsenicum 15C. So I say, take it every hour at first for three doses, And after that, every two hours. And she recovered progressively. I talked to her last night, maybe at 10 o'clock last night after the third day. And she says, I'm fully recovered since yesterday morning. Fully recovered. Nothing. No fever. Nothing. Nothing. No energy is back to nine or 10. This is a colleague which, which, uh, with much traveling and going from gelsimum as a prophylactis uh, to um, brownia. So here's a person, you will read it later. She travels all around, around the world and so on in, during the epidemic, right in the midst of the epidemic. Look at the, the airplane she takes. She gives the time, no, like uh, nine international flights, twice in San Francisco airport, three times in Chicago, twice in Paris, et cetera, et cetera. And she takes gelsimum for prevention. Mm, it's not perfect, but eventually she becomes sick. She takes uh, brownia and she recovers. So it seems like gelsimum was not good, was not uh, protecting her, but brownia did, uh, she did recover with the brownia. So it would have protected her if she had taken it. I'll leave that story for you to read. From Italy, they describe the symptom. Or here's a really good, is this, this is from Southern France. Uh, it's a doctor, I don't know his name. He made an intervention during the American Institute of Homeopathy webinar last Wednesday. And he said, beryllium works, quick, work, works quickly in patients with uh, uh, COVID-19, especially the one that are, are um, have uh, pneumonia. Here from China, there was 14 patients. They described eight times they give gelsimium. Uh, three times uh, brownia and the other were like a paterium and so on. However, they, they were not able to describe the follow-up or show that they were treated just for, for political reason. So I assume they have recovered. From uh, Germany, we have feedback of about 30 homeopaths uh, in the past 14 to 21 days and they show gelsium followed by uh, Brownia and Eupaterium perfilatum. Dr. Sh Fred Schmidt from France said, I just received a message from Italian. They treat hundreds of patients of person with Brownia and arsenicum quite quickly. And the main remedy at this stage in, in France is Brownia. So Brownia seems like more and more it looks good. Professor Resch, uh, Gerhard Resch from uh, Vienna has treated several light cases of COVID-19 and one severe one. In all cases, he has seen good effect with lobelia piperescens. You, you, you will have a lot of Mathematica given about this remedy uh, later in the, in, the, in, the, in the text. So we can skip this here. There's a confirmation from Belgium about uh, lobelia piperescens. So it's not just one doctor, one place, but at least two. Um, here we have result from the American Institute database. Um, and uh, this is up Thursday, 102 doctor uh, omipads around the world that report their case. So far, 34 cases have been submitted. In 50% of the case, Brownia seems to be helpful or curative, which, which is about what I have estimated. 60% of my patient about 30 of my patients from around the world that with flu-like illness in the last eight weeks responded to brownia. So it's close, it's very similar. Uh, and here it is say when they look at the one that are uh, suspected, confirmed and possible COVID-19, it's 50-50 brownia 
arsenic amalgam. So we talk about Lobelia again. Here in France is an interesting negative um, um, result. He says, I have a uh, uh, physician, uh, yeah, I have news from a colleague that works uh, in a nursing home with 120 people. He can, he can do PCR tests. Since one week, all the residents catch a cut the, uh, the, the, the COVID-19 proved by test. My colleague gave to all of them before uh, uh, Camphora 1M, so with no success. So they were not able, so they all got it. All residents to which he gave Braonia immediately at the onset of the disease didn't get a severe form or die. All to which he gave us antimonium tartaricum or an ammonium carbonicum get very sick or die. Some now are in the critical situation and he gave to all of them Braonia. We are waiting for the results. So we don't know yet. This is very recent. I got this this morning. It's very interesting uh, uh, case because we are sure of the diagnosis of 120 people. We can say that from them, Camphora didn't have a protective effect and that Brownian did work for most of them. From Italy, they described the symptom. We'll skip this. This is just a description of the symptom. So it's good to for studying. Uh, there was one that uh, maybe I skipped. Yeah, this one. Uh, lack of olfacto, we'll come back to it. Lack of taste and smell, we'll come back to that. So the common symptomatology, but peculiar to COVID. So it's common. That means among the, the group that have the infection, it's common. Many have it, but it's peculiar to this epidemic. So that's where the genus epidemic is, is what is peculiar to this epidemic. And so here the common is pneumonia. 61 percent and uh now this was people hospitalized so 98 percent had pneumonia 77 had fever so not all have fever is interesting and not all have cough even though they have pneumonia and expiration is very little not that much i mean a little less than half ex an expiration uh, expectoration and then never seen somebody mentioning like large quantity or purulent or colored it's all like little bits of clear expectoration strangely enough so here's some more common symptom i think these are the same so i'll remove them uh, i think they're the same okay so uh the most characteristic symptom roughly one in ten present not with flu-like symptom but with diarrhea and nausea so that's important i had two patients that present only with uh, diarrhea and they were exposed at work um so be aware of this. So that's characteristic. And the remedy that helped one of the two was their chronic remedy was sulfur. Re recover quickly. And I'm going to come back to one of these patients a bit later re re regarding homeoprophylaxis. So the, the very common symptom is dry cough with great weakness, oppression of the chest and difficulty breathing, and variable temperature. When I say variable temperature, it means sometimes it could be high, sometimes it could be subnormal, sometimes it could be just a bit of fever. Nothing characteristic. The characteristic lung lesion is a diffuse multifocal fibrocytis affecting the periphery of the lung first and appearing on radio imaging on, as ground glass opacity. A, a characteristic symptom is the loss of smell and taste. Um, about from the study, between 30 and 70% of people, especially the one that are asymptomatic, seems to develop, like here is 30%, but in other places it's much higher. So 30 to 70% develop loss of taste and, uh, and um, uh, smell to the point that the American uh, Academy of Otorolangology Othoro uh, said, if you've lost the, or reduced sense of smell and lo loss of taste, are significant symptom associated with COVID and go get tested right away. So let's talk about homeoprophylaxis. It's this too early to be certain about a genus epidemicus because if we're going to do gene, uh, prophylaxis, typically you would want to use the genus epidemicus. There are several candidates.
for all, for the genus Epidemicus. It could be Brownia. It could be Beryllium. We'll come back to it. It could be Lobelia purpurans. In that order of importance, perhaps depending on the area, Arsenicum, and very less likely, Gelsinium. So this would be one, two, three, four, five. So it could be more than one because you could have more than one for the different stage of the disease. My choice is for Brownia since the beginning because more cases with the flu-like symptom have responded clearly to Brownia than any other remedy in the last two months over three continents. It is a, it is a flu remedy that tends to readily move into pneumonia. I've seen so many cases, they, they, they get sick for one or two days and they already have pneumonia. So it's typical of this uh, condition. It is one of the remedies that has loss of smell and taste with influenza. So it's a very nice uh, confirming symptom. However, there might be other strategy, like a, a strategy that I did recommend for the staff of, of a hospital. I said, give Brownia 200 as a preventive to everyone who is normally quite thirsty. So all the thirsty people, give them Brownia. The one that are thirstless, give them Gelsemium. And the one that are anxious and nervous, give them arsenicum. And we'll see which one works best. I would say that would be a good strategy here. I, I like this strategy. I it just I think we I I said that one or two days ago to one of the doctors in Michigan. And how often should people take the remedy? Well, the one in the hospital, this is a hospital staff. That means physician, nurse, and supporting staff, because they are exposed constantly, I say every five days. And uh, every four hours, as soon as they would develop uh, symptoms, so as soon as they develop chills or weakness, they take it every four hours. And then, then they contact their, uh, their uh, homeopathic practitioner. And if you don't have a homeopathic practitioner, uh, you should contact the homeopathic, the American Institute of Homeopathy. You, you go to their website and you look for the closest uh, physician in your area. But there's other association that uh, of practitioners, so you can also look for other association of homeopathic practitioners in your state or in your city. You should look. Sometimes there will be study groups, and there will be lay people that will be practicing that are would be knowledgeable enough to help you out. Certainly, it Andre, should... one other thing: the uh, National Center for Homeopathy does have a list of practitioners as well. Oh, thank you. So the National Center for Homeopathy website, you will, you will have a, a large list of also of uh, uh, practitioner that uh, use also the also the Homeopathic Academy of Naturopathic Physicians. Yes, and and Nash, just to name a few. Okay, but this is for North America, so uh, I'm assuming that we have to address all the national, the different uh, nation of the world. So let's say if it, if somebody's in Denmark, I'm, I would think there's there, not. I would think I know there's a uh, an association. So every country probably has an association, except perhaps where it's uh, homeopathy is illegal, which there is places where it's illegal to practice. Uh, beware that prov proving could occur while you do proving. You remember the patient I said uh, a bit earlier that at Daria, he was exposed at work. Uh, there was a lot of workers uh, that had the, the COVID and he was exposed. He came home eventually and he had a severe diarrhea, unexplained and great, great weakness. So typical, uh, he never had something before like this in his life. And he recovered with his chronic remedy, which was sulfur. So here was interesting. His chronic remedy was the one that needed, like the one, the other positive one that I, sh I told you that uh, the surgeon, it needed his chronic remedy. His wife decided afterward to give him Brownia because she received a newsletter from our office that to use Brownia weekly for prevention. That was about like two weeks ago. The first do dose that she gave him, which was in the middle of the afternoon, knocked him out. He went to sleep in the middle of the afternoon right after the remedy and he slept until next morning. A week later, she gave him the second dose, his wife, and she gave him at the evening, like maybe an hour before bed, and he couldn't wait anymore. He had to go sleep and he slept. 10 straight hours. So yes, you could have proving like this, so be aware, but it's okay to have proving if it's going to prevent a serious illness. So if you have a proving like this, you could give a lower potency, it would work, or uh, dilute the remnant water and just give one drop instead, or ideally for the hypersensitive person, you dip the toothpick in water, you, you wipe it, and you just touch uh, your tongue. 
That's for the hypersensitive people. In Hong Kong, they use gelsimium to about 300,000 people, so about 5% of the population. And they also use brownia, both. So we don't have too much results. Same thing in, in uh, Macau, about 600,000 people got uh, gelsimium. No sick person re uh, that have, um, so it's hard to follow large, large population, but uh, it could be compared to other population eventually. Okay, what's the clinical approach? Now that the table is set and we understand the importance of this subject for the public, let's now look at the practical aspect and examine case management of the patient with influenza and pneumonia. As, and as you notice, patient is in bold. Why? Because we're talking about um, that first, we're talking about treatment, the treatment of the per person the patient with influenza and pneumonia and not treating influenza or pneumonia. Second, the word patient is singular to emphasize individualized treatment. The key to success in homeopathy is strict individualization. No, no, no excuse otherwise. For uh, if you have a failure, you probably you didn't individualize well enough. And here is a nice text of uh, British physician Templeton on individualization of the influenza patient. I will not read it, of course, you will read it. It's a very nice text. It says the only way to do it is individualized. Eventually, when you have a lot of case, you may recognize a patient within a few minutes. Uh, yes, you can do that very quickly. And he says that out of 100 cases in, in the last epidemic, this is the remedy that he prescribed. Yeah, prescribed. Okay, so the first step, practical step, is case taking. What does it mean, case taking? It means you gather all the symptoms that made the appearance since the onset of the illness. Here we're talking about symptom, the changes about energy. Um, chills, temperature, sweat, pain, cough, sputum, respiration, complexion, thirst, appetite, taste, smell, pulse, mood, sensitivity, disposition, and behavior, tongue, sleep, Headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, nosebleed, etc., etc., etc. All the symptoms, no excuse. As a rule, it is better to also know the chronic case of, or remedy of the patient, as in about 50% of the case of acute remedy, it is the same as the chronic remedy of the person, probably, particularly in, case, in cases um, in, in uh, when. It's particularly when it in uh, let's say when it the cases when cases reach the pneumonia stage. So in pneumonia it could be fifty percent. In this epidemic we don't know, but average people with pneumonia, fifty percent of them will need their chronic remedy. But during influenza, the remedy of the influenza part, the early part, would be ninety five percent would be a dissimilar remedy as a rule. So just be aware of that. In this current epidemic, we don't have enough cases, uh, enough experience to know an approximate percentage of people who develop pneumonia will require the chronic remedy. So we, I don't have enough case to tell you. So far, it seems the rule applies 50-50. Step two, you've gathered the symptom. What do you do? You analyze the symptom. Here, you must ask yourself the question, what is most peculiar in this case with influenza or pneumonia? in this epidemic. You then assemble all the most characteristic symptoms of the disease and arrange them in a hierarchy. You have then created the genius of the disease. You now need to find in the Mathematica the remedy whose genius is most similar to the one of the disease of the patient. You may, you may first need to repertorize the case to find out which remedy, remedies, because there will be many remedies, needs to be studied first. Be ready to prescribe with certainty any remedy in our Mathematica. There's no recipe. It's, it has to be individualized. And it's the law of similar that decides. As long as there's a clear correspondence of geniuses. I have treated over the year, um, yeah, a great number of cases with pneumonia. And the, overall, my experience has been the same. The, the following, for a patient with pneumonia, not uh, the flu, is in this order of importance. Phosphorus, sulfur, brownia, followed by 
lacopodium, calicaboricum, belladonna, entomum tartaricum, acronitum, epicac, caledonium, transform for sarcum. I could even put cali, uh, carbo, carbo uh, vegetabilis someplace in there. Maybe, uh, let me see. Yeah, before epicac, is it? Carbo. See? Okay, very good. Uh, the other, oh, there is carbo. Okay, so the other remedy are cannabis and dickies, arsenicum album, so not that often, and and, and et cetera, et cetera. You can look at that. So be aware that some of the above list of remedy are commonly indicated in, as chronic remedy. This means it's always better to have the chronic case in order to prescribe with certainty in case with pneumonia. For instance, the pneumonia, the phosphorus patient will most likely need no other remedy than phosphorus if they develop pneumonia. But you still need to have all the characteristic symptoms of uh, phosphorus if they do develop uh, pneumonia. Once you have the gut feeling of similarity, you need to administer the remedy in the optimal pathology. Optimal pathology means optimal potency, not too high, not too low. Optimal repetition, not too often enough so they recover in an optimal way. And the way of administrating the remedy. Typically, if you know, know better, you just give one pellet of the remedy as needed. So it could be every two hours, every four hours, if it's very acute, every hour for three dose. Sometimes if it's urgent, it would be every five to 20 minutes for three, four, five, six dose. It, and the more you have to repeat frequently, the less you will give pellet. You'll just put in water, stir the water, and administer a bit of the water. It doesn't matter how much um, in case of emergency. So it could be from a drop to a tablespoon if the person can swallow. The greater the amount of water, the, more, the greater the re reaction of the patient to the remedy. This means that the partiality must be individualized in each patient at each visit. Therefore, at each visit, the potency, the repetition, and the way of administering the remedy must be individualized and adapted to the current circumstances and state of the patient. <clears throat> so here I mentioned that the higher potency have given the best result in, in pneumonia. I'll skip that. I will let you read it. Um, and when you treat people with, uh, uh, with influenza and pneumonia right now, especially pneumonia, you will monitor the heart rate, the temperature, the, the respiratory rate, the pain, the degree of pain like 0 to 10, the energy 0 to 10, the, uh, the cough, the expectation to know very, very quickly, I would say within an hour, if the patient got the right remedy as a rule. The remedy is repeated less often as the patient is improving. It would be a mistake to stop the treatment if the patient shows sign of recovery because if you do that, especially with patients with pneumonia and especially with this epidemic, because I'm familiar with it a bit now, you don't stop until full recovery. So you can continue. At the very least, you would give a dose before bed, at very least, because at night you could have a relapse and the patient could be very, very sick by morning. <clears throat> the patient is thus follow until complete resolution of the symptom. Uh, beware, there might be a change of picture in, during the course of treatment, and there will be a change of uh, remedy. So it's not unusual. There are four stages of pneumonia. It's not unusual. You'll treat somebody in, in the inflammatory first stage, and it's at the end of the inflammation, the patient feels better, but they're already in the second stage. They were already had started. So the, the remedy of the first stage doesn't fit anymore, and now you have a full-blown case of um, uh, consolidation, effusion. So now you need a second remedy to complete your uh, the work, but it will be the patient will tell you the symptom. It will be clear. I explained this in this paragraph. Uh, hygienic measure: so rest, avoiding of stress, fresh air, and avoiding of keeping the patient in a room with stall air. Hydration of the febrile patient or necessary hygienic measure to assure quick recovery. When patient experience pain, I recommend that they drink two glasses of water within an hour. And as a rule, the pain decreases and the patient feels better because the more water in the system, they find it, it's like a bit like hydrotherapy is just better perfusion of blood in the tissue, less inflammation, less pain. There are adjunctive natural approach that can be used and probably 
uh, one of the most useful would be water fasting in the febrile patient. So everybody that has a, uh, has a, a develop a fever should fast until rec they have recovered the fever. Fast just put water. If you're diabetic, you have to check your insulin, of course. If you're under other medication, you will check with your healthcare practitioner how to fast uh, with the medication you're taking. As a rule, as long as the fever persists, recovery will be speeded up if the patient is fasted. All the energy is for healing. Here, I want to point out that Anemann did not write the Argonon of homeopathy, but he wrote the Argonon of medicine, which is a blueprint of how to practice medicine. And in, in this, he include psychotherapeutic, electrotherapy, magnetic energy, manual therapy, and finally, hydrotherapy. And hydrotherapy, Anemann knew how to practice hydrotherapy from his letter to his patient and last paragraph of the Argonon 291. So, and this is, I would say, if uh, if a, if your patient does not have the remedy because there are pharmacy are closed at ten o'clock at night, they have no access to the remedy. You can always do either therapy, and you will. Every patient should survive if it's well done. It's easy to do. Everybody has water at home. They have, you have blankets. You have wool. You have a cotton, and the possibility to get warm water. So with warm and cold water, and uh, towels and so on, you can do it. So the underlying principle of either therapy is very simple. The healing of tissue, so let's say pneumonia, is directly proportional to the amount of blood flow. The greater is the blood flow in and out of a disease organ, the greater the defense, the detef detoxification, the nourishment and the restoration of the tissue, of this tissue, and therefore the greater is the healing process. Ahneman was right. If we look at statistics of anhydrotherapy and pneumonia, they are the closest to the one obtained by genuine um, Anumanian homeopathy. So if you look here, genuine Anumanian homeopathy, we saw that before 0 0.4, which was um, eight times better than just homeotherapeutic. And if we look at hydrotherapy, let me see, I will move this so we can see it better. So if we look at hydrotherapy, 1.6, it's uh, uh, two, two times better than homeotherapeutic. But if you combine both, and that's the genius of naturopathic medicine, is to be able to combine different approach modality, like Ahneman suggests in the Argonaut, you have a synergistic effect, and thus no one should ever die uh, of pneumonia under good uh, natural treatment. I cannot imagine it. If you have a good a physician can, who is an artist and can manipulate the different modality of treatment, um, nobody should ever die of pneumonia. As long as the patient is compliant, you have access to the remedy. It should be fairly simple, even the most severe. Prognosis of the homeopathic treatment of the patient with influenza and pneumonia. A rapid and complete recovery of health and without side effect should be expected in 100% of cases of influenza pneumonia under homeopathic treatment uh, of, of um, of uh, uh, under homeopathic treatment, regardless of the degree of difficulty, when the treatment is based on the totality of the acute and chronic symptom picture, an optimal pathology, and proper case management, which would include proper hygienic and adjuvant care, and the right condition are met. That is. Readily accessible range of remedy and potency, patient compliance, health conducive, uh, health conducive environment, and low stress, who should have perfect success. The patient should begin to improve soon after taking the the mo the, the remedy, the most the similimum, I should write, which is the remedy you found to be the most similar. And the patient is followed closely to ensure that the recovery is steady and without any relapse. Since, okay, so I'll, I, I give some cases here. Like I have seen people with like all kinds of patients like AIDS and cystic fibrosis and cryptococcal meningitis. They all recover. P.P. Wells, who was a well-known practitioner who had mastered homeopathy through many long years of assiduous study and who had a very busy uh, practice in uh, Brooklyn, New York, 
reported a zero mortality rate in close to 500 cases in this in the first 43 years of his practice. The response always been uniform. That is, as soon as a remedy with a high degree of similarity is given, uh, uh, there is a healing response, which if it, it is kept up, which will lead the patient to a quick and complete recovery. Recovery is not only prompt, but often patient will mention afterwards that they feel better than at any other times in their life they can remember. As if the uh, acute pneumonia helped to heal other things that were unhealed in the person. Maybe old infection when they were a child and so on. The immune system got uh, corrected. It would actually be hard to imagine having a pneumonia patient die under genuine homeopathy as long as a skilled physician remain at the bedside. I cannot imagine it because I have done it on the phone uh, without being able to examine the patient. And you know, I just get a call and they say, can you do something? They said the, the person will die very soon. I said, is the patient breathing? And I do it on the phone long distance without even looking at the patient. And I can do it. I mean, I can do it. Anybody can do it. That applies the fundamental principle. So here are some example. Conclusion. So yeah, mortality in pneumonia patient is very, very low. Recovery is prompt and complete without side effect. Um, and it's very important to address the subject of pneumonia because it's endemic all around the world. And now with COVID, it's even more important. So you can read all the, how it affects uh, society. So it's very, very important that we, uh, as OMIPAC practitioner, know how to deal with it properly. Okay. Um, extra point, I think I've covered that I, I mentioned about eating and sleeping well to exercise properly and to have mental and emotional poise. Here, I'm, I give you a video about the power of vegan diet composed of wholesome food for um, uh, increasing immunity. There is uh, evidence that if you have nutritional yeast, it, which will uh, supply beta glucans, it will improve like the IgA in the mouth. And you can see that in this video. And chlorella for athletes who exercise um, can also boost their immune system, but only if they exercise. So you can see that in this video. Um, yeah. So here for people here, there, there's, an, a, there's a good video. It's called Exercise That Prolong Your Life by Stephen Esser. Uh, and it can be also done for bedroom people. He does it in the video for bedroom people. Um, management of the fever operation. Fever is is very important how to know how to manage uh, the patient with fever. Fever is beneficial for survival, and its suppression tends to be detrimental. Uh, so. One of the goals you want to do is to increase blood circulation during fever, and you can do that with hydrotherapy. Why it's not good to give NSAID, like non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, or antipyretic, like the Tylenol, and perhaps even antitussive. There's a little reference there. I give you plenty, plenty of um, things like, for instance, inf influenza infect subject who receive antipyretic, like Tylenol, were sick on average longer. Uh, it, it diminished uh, immunity, all kinds of reasons for page and page and page. Aggressively treating fever in critically ill patient may lead to a higher mortality rate. That means decreasing fever in critically ill people, more will die. Mortality is greater and so on. So I will let you with this information so you can read it on all the references are there, by the way, you just look here. No, you can have the reference. All the reference are there. Okay. So we'll skip this section for you to look. I'm sorry for the going up and down. Just be patient with me until we see another yellow. Oh, genius epidemicus. Okay. Big subject. So the genius epidemicus is the remedy you want to identify. I give a long lecture about the, the genus epinicus, and then simply it's not called genus, but genus epinicus. And I say here why it's, it's, it's not genus epinicus. Uh, like genus denotes a genera, 
or a group in the classification of plants and animals. And we're not talking about this here. Here we're talking about the genius denoting the more, the very essence, the innate nature, the identity, the prevalent character of an epidemic. Okay, so I give you a lot of information from Hippocrates to Hahnemann about it. We can skip that, we can read about it. So here, so far, we have not found the genus Epidemicus, but the closest, like I've said before, is uh, Braonia. But we may have two, actually. Braonia for the flu and um, the, actually, we may have three. Braonia for, to prevent the flu or the chronic remedy of the patient and or um, gelstimium, actually, for thirstless person. Arsenicum for nervous and uh, uh, we, we don't have any records so far, but it, it could work. Uh, nervous and chilly person. And uh, finally, uh, beryllium for people with lung disease. So, okay, so I'll let you read about the genus Epinicus. It's quite long. Warnings about the genus Epinicus. That's important. So, you have to be careful not to do routing prescribing. Yeah, it could be a minority of case. Uh, no, be, beware that other remedy might appear to be better indicated in the minority of case. So you may have a genus of case that will fit like 50% of the case, but five other remedy will do the other 50%. So be aware of that. Beware that it's not always easy to find one remedy for an entire epidemic, and especially during a pandemic for all parts of the world, especially at the beginning of an epidemic. And uh, Farrington, um, the father, uh, gives two, two examples how difficult it was to find the genus Epidemicus. I have a lot of literature on genus Epidemicus, but I didn't include it here. Also, the genus Epidemicus tends to change from one climatic area to another. From what from the seashore to the to the mountains, beware! Beware! It has happened that the genus epidemicus of one epidemic may be the same as the one of another epidemic occurring during the same season. For instance, let's say uh, a flu epidemic and during the winter. And I give some example here from uh, the literature. Beware that the genus epidemicus can be different within a, a same town. For instance, the genus of for the residents along the river, and another gen, uh, genus for the ones up on the hill. Beware the genus epidemicus may change in the same locality within an epidemic. <clears throat> Beware that the genus epidemicus may be different for the different stage of an epidemic during the, in the same locality. With cholera, for instance, with cholera, camphora was for the first stage, cuprum was for the second stage. And finally, Veratrum was for the for the collapsed state, and uh, but it was not the same. That was the ma the the one that dominated maybe the first thirty years. But in the eighteen sixty, there was they start to use other remedies such as sulfur, for instance, that would be um, a good preventative, and it was the genus Epidemicus of some epidemics that occur in the United States. Great advantage to know the genus Epidemicus. Better result, better cure. In patient in the early stage or late stage of the disease, especially for newcomer to homeopathy. So we we may have some newcomers here to homeopathy. We're gonna give we're gonna give you tricks to identify uh, the few the most indicated remedy, the most likely remedy. And if you use it for prevention, uh, it would be easy for you. You will. Uh, another advantage is, is the quickness of the cure. You don't have to zigzag your case. You, the patient just go through it and it's done. And and the successful odds for prophylaxis for the one that have not been are asymptomatic or have not been exposed, the odds of of uh, being uh, of protecting them becomes very very high. Then uh, my experience on this subject is greatly limited because I practice I have patients from different uh, many different locality on five different continents, so it seems to be always different. But in this one. Barnia seems to be dominating all the time. So here we talk about common remedies of the flu, different uh, outcomes people have show. Now we go into the Mathematica. So here, when we talk about the Mathematica, you want to be able to quickly differentiate the most known remedy through some of the keynotes. For instance, 
you say, is the patient thirsty or not thirsty? Okay, so we have thirsty remedy. Phosphorus is thirsty. We have brownia that is thirsty. We have repetitorium perfoliatum is thirsty, arsenicum, and camphora. But they're all thirsty different. For instance, phosphorus is thirsty for a large quantity of ice cold water. You, you should not prescribe phosphorus if the patient likes warm or hot drinks. So if the patient in the background is drinking um, a tea to, to feel good, it's not phosphorus. And even room temperature drinks tends to be distasteful to the phosphorus patient. So unless they drink, they want ice cold water in large quantity, unlikely it's phosphorus. So just by this symptom, you can know if you're on the right track or, or, or not on the right track. Brownia. They, they tend to have large thirst for cold or warm or even hot drinks, but may not drink often because of the motion require, the motion effort requires, especially the motion required to drink. So they have to get up, take the drink. They don't like to move. They don't want to be bothered. So they might not drink very often, but they're very thirsty. Eupaterum perfoliatum is very thirsty before and during chill and fever. So if you don't have the thirst as the first symptom, it's unlikely to be um, eupaterum perfoliatum. It has to be the first symptom. Before they had the chill, before they had the weakness, before they had the, the fever, they have to have become thirsty first. That's how you identify this remedy. One of the main ways to identify this remedy. Arsenicum album, thirsty for cold, but usually, but typically more for warm drinks and and in small sip that's a very very important camphora insatiable burning thirst not not quenched by incredible uh, by the incredible quantity of cold drinks Desire to drink, but they're not very feeling thirsty. That's the peculiar thing. They may not feel thirsty. Then you have thirstless remedy, gelsimium, antimum tartaricum, posata. If the patient is thirsty, do not prescribe gelsimium. It will not work. Okay, the patient must be thirstless, or at the very least, the patient, if it was a very thirsty remedy, they must have de decreased their thirst dramatically, and they will tend to have a dry mouth without thirst. So yes. Uh, if they're thirsty, don't prescribe just him. Here we have antimum tartaricum. It's a it's a, a thirstless remedy, and it has this peculiar symptom: loss of taste and smell during influenza. So is Pasatella, who is also will tend to have a very dry mouth, even to the point where it will feel like cotton in the mouth, like their tongue stick to the palate, and but they have no thirst. They're not interested. Loss of smell and taste, which is a, a, a keynote of this epidemic. You have six remedy that tends to have this during influenza, among which, which Browner was found in one patient. It cured the patient. Uh, so that is a very nice confirming symptom. So here are some rubric. One thing uh, of uh, loss of taste during, pneumonia, during influenza. Uh, loss of uh, smell and taste together. Uh, loss of taste in influenza. Now we go to the prostration. So great state of prostration. So then you think of gelsimium, which will be sleepy. Ear will be weak and uh, restless. Ear, another one, lobelia, will be extremely uh, profound state of exhaustion. Camphora more like a state of collapse. Eupaterium also very weak, especially in old people. Phosphorus, sarcolactic acid also will, will have this profound state. Not as, as we go down, uh, it's, no, I couldn't say that. Yeah, but they all have it, this, this sarcolactic acid, especially the muscle feels very, very weak. Pay attention always to the locality and direction of the chills. Um, gelsimium, uh, the chills will be up and down the back, like eupaterium, up and down the middle of the back, like it's very interesting. And they can also, they can have chills also extends from the hands and the feet. Very useful. 
brownia, not all the time, but I've seen it. Uh, the, it extends from the tip of the toes and the fingers. <clears throat> Temperature of the room is also very uh, deciding factor. For instance, if the patient likes a cool room, it's not arsenicum album. And if the patient likes a moderate room, it's not arsenicum album. The patient to prescribe arsenicum album needs to have the room warmer than uh, no to to is the, the the warmer the better. So for instance, twenty five degrees or more, seventy five Fahrenheit or above. So sometimes I say to the patient, so a good way to question the patient here, it says this: What temperature you like the thermostat in the room? So they say, well, my husband keeps it at 71, okay? So I say, what would bother you more if it goes up to 73 or goes down to 69? Oh, he says, oh, no, uh, 73. So this is a patient that is worse in a warm room. Why? I have difficulty breathing. Okay, so difficulty breathing worse in a warm room. On the other hand, you'll say, a patient will say, uh, oh, 69, that would be not pleasant for me. Okay. What about how would 75 be? Oh, that would be even better. What about 77? Oh, that would be great. So as you go up, the more you think of arsenicum album. They, and they cannot tolerate the draft arsenicum album. They will tend to overdress and they will have difficulty warming up. Even by the stove or electric thing, if they move room, they have to sit by the, the space heater or whatever, or they will carry with them or they will have pads to warm themselves up because the difficulty to warm them up. So if the patient does not want to be in a very warm room, if they have the choice, if they have the choice, it's unlikely arsenic amabo. Here camphora is very peculiar. Patient is cold subjectively and objectively. You can touch them. They're cold to touch. And they want they want warmth, but they they prefer to be uncovered. It's as if all the blood is uh, drawn inside. They, they feel kind of warm inside, uh, but it's cold on the outside. So if they cover, it makes them uncomfortable. Uh, so it's very, very peculiar. So if you cover them, they'll put the cover off. Pasatella, you cannot prescribe Pasatella to a patient that doesn't like the window open. So if you say, what about if you open the window? Oh, no, 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 I don't like that. Don't prescribe it. On the other hand, uh, the Pasatella will always tend to have the window open everywhere where they go. If the room goes above 21 degrees or 70 degrees, it starts to be uncomfortable. They prefer the room around, uh, let's say, they would like at 19 or even below or uh, 68 in, in um uh, yeah, six, uh, 68 or below or in, in uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, the appearance of the face can be very important. Like, for instance, arsenicum, if you don't have an anxious face, oftentimes I will say uh, to an attendant, can you describe me the face of the person if I think they need arsenicum? Say, oh, they look very, very worried. Oh, there you go. Very strong confirming symptom. Um... Um, this doesn't belong here. This goes to the this, the onset. So it's a, at the wrong place. So it says how long it takes to develop the symptom. So both uh, uh, brownia and uh, gelsimium tends to be, uh, um, want to be quiet, don't want to be uh, disturbed, but uh, gelsimium looks more sick. Here, the, here is the 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 face of Justin. You know, I lost the face of uh, Brown. The face of Brown is not so peculiar. It's just they don't want to move, and they don't want. They're irritable if you disturb them. Uh, camphora. Yeah, I've mentioned that. Um. Yeah. So the, here's the the Justinium. The disposition. So arsenicum is very easy. If they're not anxious, do not prescribe arsenicum. The anxiety will tend to be a restless anxiety characterized by fear of death, very, very strong, and fear of being alone. So if somebody leaves the room or leaves the house, it would be uh, not tolerable. It would be very difficult for them to, to do that. Uh, Pasatel will tend to be sad and weepy. Brownia wants to be perfectly quiet. If, they're, if they don't move, they have less pain or no pain. So that's very a very strong characteristic of the running.
it's worse from the slight motion. If they don't move, it could be down to zero. So they feel both mentally and physically better when they're not moving. And if you disturb them, they don't like that because mentally they have to move and physically they, they may have to move them out. So they don't like to move. They want to be perfectly still. Phosphorus is the desire for company and sympathy and much better from it. Can foreign think they're going to die? Um, and they have a great, uh, um, a great anxiety. Uh, it could be anywhere from great anxiety to general apathy. We mentioned that that uh, uh, yeah, just they're very sleepy. They can sleep for many many hours during the day. They feel heavy. Their high lids will feel heavy. Their head will feel heavy. Their body will feel heavy. There's heaviness everywhere, and they don't want to be disturbed. There are remedies that will be used for long-lasting weakness, very useful. There's nitrum uh, salicylum, but there's other that you can consult here, like conium, are known to have been very useful. Caliphosphoricum also uh, are known to help people that have um, prolonged weakness after influenza. So you should use these remedies. Um, so here you can also look at convalescence, ailments from after influenza, and you have also a large group of, uh, not a large, a certain number of remedies. Another way also to differentiate one remedy from the other, you can look at motion. Both uh, Gelsimum and, and uh, Brownia don't want to move. The first one, because they, have, they don't have energy and they have apathy, I should say in apathy. And the second one, Brownia, because movement aggravate at all level. Rootstocks needs to move or change position, but the first movement or change of position aggravate, and then the continued motion, or after having changed position, it ameliorates. So they're, they go into certain position, after five, 10 minutes, it start to be uncomfortable. They move, it's more painful when they move. They go to the other side, Ha! Huh. They have relief from the side they were lying on, or whatever joints or whatever, and then they wait five, ten minutes, and it builds up, and now they have to change again, and it's painful during the change of position, but better after having changed position. Eupaterium is a very restless remedy, despite being very weak. They they will be restless, and they will have they will want to move, but they're not better for motion. So here mm -hmm. they want to move, but not better. So and they, they cannot stop not moving, even though they know they will be worse. And characteristically, the, the achiness, the pain is in the bones. They can feel a uh, bruise all over the body, like many remedies will feel that, but particularly to Eupaterium, which is called bones, um, bo um, break bone fever, is the bone feels as if broken. So this is a huge keynote. If you have that symptom and you have a bit uh, one or two confirmatory, you have a winner there. Um, so here's, uh, yeah, cannot keep still, although there's a great desire to do so. So they want to stay still, but they cannot, they have to move. They're worse. They're not better from motion. Arsenicum is very restless from an inner state of anxiety, but the restless is, is present despite a great weakness. So they feel the more weak they the more restless they are, maybe the more the closest they feel they're losing it, they're going towards death. You now the weaker you are, and motion doesn't make it uh, doesn't make it better. It might maybe kind of distract a bit the anxiety, but so little that it doesn't help at all. Adauka, which was proven by uh, rural A's in Connecticut, is in between. Let's say uh, rootstocks and brownia. They have an aversion to move because of the weakness of gelsimum, they say, but is better from the motion, so of root stocks. So uh, a, a bit of a combination there. Uh, the onset, aconet, aconitum, belladonna, ferrum fos, sudden onset. If they have a slow onset, don't even think of this remedy. Just cancel it. Brownia, gelsimum, slow and progressive, over 12, 24 hours. This is a matter of hours, this is a matter of a day, half a day to a day, slow, or longer, like 36 hours.
Okay, so now I give a lot about the Mathematica, a lot of reference people can read about the Mathematica. I will not go over it. I will let you read it. It's a lot of information. It's it's uh, from different author. I didn't always put the author because I lost them after a while, but it's easy to find if you want to know the author. Sometimes it's me, sometimes it's another author, but I'm not trying to steal anybody's material. It's just for this, it's just my notes to you. So if, if you want me to read, to have my notes, these are my notes. And sometimes the author is not always uh, credited, but um, it's easy to find who's the author of these texts as a rule. As a rule, I put the name. So like right now, there's no author. That means um, we will find it at the next paragraph where there'll be an author. That means this comes from, um, like we're talking about Brown here. See, there's a lot to read here about Brown. It's come from Shepard. Oh no, it was Borland. It was Borland. And here's Shepard comes back with, uh, okay, beryllium. So this is the one I want to pay. I, I told you I was going to spend some time on. <coughs> so beryllium uh, as fibrosis of the lung, beryllium should be thought of in all respiratory condition with dyspnea from slight exertion often out of proportion to the osculatory finding. And that's what you find uh, to some degree in this condition. Uh, there's no rail, there's no ronchi or very, very little, but the people can barely breathe. So this is very, very prominent in this remedy. Actually, I did, I do have, um, I do have, um, it would be th this one. Here's the representation of all the symptoms of beryllium that we have in the repertory. So you can you can um, look at some of the things that it will say, let's say, um, um, you, or you, you'll have like better from open air. Um, anyway, you'll see, a lot, a lot of this, a lot of symptom around the nose and mouth, like dryness of the lips. A lot of symptom there, also of the lips. You see, um, the throat and and some modality. Nothing much confirmed because it was not much used. So, and you'll see very little about the chest because it's not being used homeopathically. Look here, um, almost nothing. Yeah, here's the chest, constriction, tightness, emphysema, but very little like uh, for inflammation of the lung, just one mention, nothing particular. So let's go back to the Mathematica. So here, tracheal bronchitis would, would fit this case cough, rails, both lungs, non-productive, like in like in COVID, except for occasional blood strain mucus. This have not seen though. Um, vital capacity is reduced because probably the oxygenation is going down uh, of the patient. So, um, and they have low grade fever. So let me see, is reduced. So here we have also low grade fever and this will fit this epidemic. So it's a very, very, uh, it, it could be the genus Epidemicus to prevent the second stage of the, of the, of the um, epidemic. So when people start to have shortness of breath, uh, it could be still brownia, but if they're not worse from motion, if they go down very, very quickly, and then you would, should think of beryllium. Um, so here on the x-ray, this for Bill William, the proving, uh, diffuse aziness, irregular area of infiltration with prominent uh, peribronchial markings. So one is more bronchial and one is more the periphery of the lungs, but still it's a diffuse aziness, ir irregular area of infiltration, very, very similar to the COVID. Oxygen and rest must of most benefit. Um, so, like the, the in this epidemic, people need oxygen and they are put on a respirator and they are put to rest completely. 
and cough, dyspnea, and undue fatigue. So this would be very, very good. Combining the poisonous symptom with those of the proving, it is possible to envisage the use of this drug in chest conditions such as one finds in influenza, especially in the case which in some epidemic are not uncommon, where dyspnea, more marked than one should expect, like in this case from physical sign, exactly like in this epidemic, it's encounter, it's encounter. If you from it's this angle, the drug which it resembles in the premonitory stage of uh, okay, so we'll we'll go we'll skip that. Most of this the the head symptom looks like brown, yeah. This is from Douglas Ross, which is a British homeopath. The proving was done in, uh, I think it was done in England. Yeah, tracheobronchitis with sticky mucus. I have seen that in patient right now with this, the flu epidemic lately. It's sticky mucus. It's not easy to bring out. Intense pain behind the sternum and dyspnea. So very, very typical of what we have seen lately. Influenza and chesty condition. So right away it goes to the chest the genius of this epidemic, where the distance is greater than the physical sign. Very, very good. So you see, okay, so we, I think we read this. So here's the proving symptom. Like for instance, this could be interesting. It's interesting, of all the 30 patients that I have treated in the last uh, two months with flu-like illness and, and or pneumonia, only the one that with pneumonia had a bit of phlegm. Nobody had a lot of phlegm. Nobody had like huge amount of sputum. Very few had enough phlegm to be able to taste it. And when they would bring phlegm out, it seems clear sometimes with a streak of yellow, but not much more than that. So no big expectoration in this remedy, like uh, in this remedy, like in this epidemic. Um, so you must swallow. Clearing the throat. Nausea, we have nausea with this remedy. Actually, probably not all the symptoms. Let's look here. It says nausea, worse on the side of food and uh, drink. Riding in the bus, better from lying down and eating. So let's look if how many of these symptoms are in the repertory. I'll put them in probably today. We'll see right away. We'll go to the stomach part. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's look. Better eating is there. Looking at food is there. So they're all there. That's fine. Better lying down. Better, worse lying. Okay, so it's there. So we, uh, no, we're going back to this part. Up by, okay. Um, palpitation. I had pa and patient with dizziness and faintness. I had I seen that in the last uh, two months. So then we go with the other remedy, and I will not go over that. Um, we'll skip. You can all read it. Um, it's fairly easy to identify these remedy, but I give you a lot of literature. So you can think about it. And why I put all this literature, it's also for people that don't have books. So maybe we have somebody right now listening to us from a hospital in Africa. They don't have any books of homeopathy. So I'm gonna give this text to everyone. And um, hmm, I guess something didn't go out in my slide. Something went wrong in my slide. Let me see, I had some slide. Let me see if it's, what happened to my slide? Uh, oh, I see myself. Uh, let me see. I, I had two slides I added today. Mm. I don't think so. No, okay. So this, what I want to show you is this. Is this too? This and 
So here you have a kit that is long, like, like the, the length of a, a pen, very small pen. So it's not very big. And that one you can put in your pocket. If you have a large pocket, it will go in the pocket. Maybe one and a half inch tall, just enough to put like half drum bottle. And you can put 50 of them in a row. There's five in this row and there's 10 here. So there's 50. So with this little kit, if this little kit was given to every, um, with, with all the, the main remedy that would be used during an epidemic or for, let's say, influenza pneumonia, if the, a kit like this was given to every village of the world, every clinic, every hospital, every community, community center with a little book that explain how to use it. Very simple. Is the patient thirsty, not thirsty? The patient wants a room warm, not warm. What is the disposition of the patient? Uh, what makes their pain better and worse? Very, very simply, within five, 10 minutes, they would be able to identify the most similar remedy in the epidemic. And especially today, with access to uh, the internet, they could communicate with uh, uh, data bank, or they could come in with other the the rest of the homeopathic community. People that are completely new to homeopathy could save thousands, thousands, millions of lives by uh, using these little kits. It would be very, very simple because in theory, if homeopathy is well applied and the principle of natural medicine are well applied, nobody should ever die from pneumonia. No children, no old person, no person with comorbidity should die of pneumonia. It doesn't doesn't matter the severity. I've seen it. I've, I've been in the trench. I can report from the trench that yes, uh, it's 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 a law of nature. And even though the person might be in a dire situation, you give the right remedy, there is the patient comes back to life and can live for very very long after being on the dead on their dead bed. Okay. Um, Camphora, Anaman that predicted, you know, like says, uh, when the influenza and they're making severe comes among us, as it does occasionally, when the hot stage has already commenced, camphora is of service only as a palliative. That's Hahnemann talking, certainly, but an invaluable palliative, seeing that the disease is one of, of short duration. It should be given in frequent but shorter, uh, but shorten the duration of the disease but render it much milder and hence it conduct the disease inequitably to its termination. On the, on, and then he says, on, and that's Hahnemann talking, he says, on the other hand, Nagzonka in a single dose could put an end to the epidemic. Yeah, sure, depending on the epidemic. In our epidemic, unlikely. It doesn't look good because I've never seen it indicated really yet. And the people that have applied routinely uh, except in Iran, I have to say, in Iran, they say they report 40 cases, but, you know, people were treated in hospital, would have recovered or not treated uh, at that time, but the 40 that received can recover, the follow-up are not always good, you know, and just say, oh, recovered, oh, recovered. We don't have, like, the, the, the time, but in my experience, I don't know if can is indicated in this epidemic. It's good to have, it's good to have in case it, it become indicated, but right now, I don't see it. Lobelia purpurans, so we didn't talk about it before. Oh, we, we did talk about it, but not about the Metamica. This is uh, the one that was proven by Dr. White. So here it's a lot of symptom of dyspnea, profound prostration of all the vital force and the nervous system, <clears throat> respiratory paralysis, nervous pr uh, prostration of influenza. Very, very, very uh, similar to our epidemic. This I've not seen, by the way. Tongue white and paralyzed, I've not seen it. Uh, people don't have a coated tongue as a rule. I ask uh, my patient, look at your tongue. They don't have a coated tongue, except the pneumonia person, perhaps. So here is the one of Dr. White. It's in the, uh, actually, it's, it was in the, uh, it's a French journal. It's called the Revue Homéopathique Belge. So it was in 18... I think the first mention is in 1889 or 1888 in the in a journal of uh, homeopathy. 
uh, of from Belgium. Um, anyway, I give as much uh, information that I have found here. So there's a lot of modality and things like this. Um, oh, we can skip this. Lobelia prepare uh, uh, the, the picture, and this is a paper that was present uh, sent to me by our friend uh, Farrakh Master. So he gives his uh, his take on it. I find he says this is Farrakh Master, not me. I find this remedy very useful in terminal stage of viral illness that attacks the lungs. It also has influence like like picture. I have made following addition to radar program few years back. I think we can apply this for COVID-19 terminal stage. This medicine act best when repeated frequently in the 1M. So we hear some addition to the repertory, which I'll do add to our repertory to the to the uh, our version of the uh, complete repertory 4.5. Okay, so here's the repertorization, but it didn't show here. Oh yeah, there it is. It shows it for comparison with other remedies. So the we have to look at the symptom here, and then you you look at the representation here. Okay, so I give it to you. Uh, for arsenicum, we've talked about that, the fear of death, uh, great anxiety. If it's not there, do not prescribe mm -hmm. arsenicum album. You cannot prescribe arsenicum album if you have a quiet, restful patient. Forget it. It will never work. As if the patient is warm and wants the cool room, forget it. It's not the right remedy. They need to have one the room very warm. Oh, here is again. We have more information on it's it's displaced, but maybe it's the same as before. Anyway, uh, oh, it it there. It's from the French Journal. It was in the. This is not in Clark, by the way. <clears throat> It's about um, it, it, a, a patient was cured of a, a heart beating like a drum. And uh, one drop of the lobelia stopped it right away, of lobelia papurum. I didn't translate it yet. Um, yeah, here it is. Uh, lobelia papurum is very useful in influenza. This is from 1904. In one epidemic, two drops, of the first situation, uh, cure after the uh, after the second dose, yeah, it says the the beating of the heart, and uh, which in patient that had um, the lungs and the the bronchi had been uh, invaded, so this would fit our epidemic. So intense prostration. Almost collapse on oncoming influenza, 1907, only big world. There's not much in the literature. I tried to find everything I could. I put it there. Uh, Borky says it's very succinct, but good. He says profound uh, prostration of the valve force, respiratory paralysis, nervous prostration of, uh, of uh, influenza, coma. I give other remedy here. We have ammonium muriaticum that have loss of smell uh, during um, problem. So is magnesium muriaticum, especially after, like Clark says, perversion of taste and smell are marked in magnesium muriaticum. And I have frequently restored with it loss of taste and smell after influenza. So it's good to know. So many people might need this remedy after the, the epidemic. Baptisia, I really don't see it in this epidemic. Come for we've talked about it. Carbo veg. I don't see carbo veg in this epidemic neither, but I put it there just for pneumonia. Cooper metallicum, I don't see in this epidemic, but it was the genus epidemicus during the 1918-1920 um, flu epidemic, especially in Connecticut, or especially what it was called the Black Death. So there was report everywhere, especially in New York, Connecticut, where people, when they would die, they would be blue to the point they would be black. And where they were in that state, dying, 
blue and black, uh, cuprum metallicum was the genus Epidemicus, and it saved a lot of case. I think I put some history here, I believe, from Royal A's. Yeah, see, Royal A's. Uh, that's all Royal A's. He used Ipone, see. By the way, I have his collection of remedies here, his own pharmacy. Ferrum phosphoricum, I don't see it so much in this epidemic. Um, also, quick coming, develops quickly. Philandrum at, uh, aquaticum is because of the, the dry cough, uh, hoarseness. So we, I have seen hoarse voice lately, uh, sometimes extinguished voice, dry cough, and shortness of breath. Stitches of the chest with oppression, I've seen that. This I have not seen, and the rest I have not necessarily seen, the, 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 the urine and so on. But this could be interesting in some cases, especially if you have some a keynote of it. Phosphorus, I have not seen it indicated in this epidemic, even in, uh, in pneumonia in the last two months. Did I have a case of pneumonia used for us? I don't think so. But it's it can be uh, a remedy of epidemic influenza. There's a lot here I put, but it's not just for this epidemic. I put it's for for people to have general knowledge about the remedy that we use in uh, epidemic of influenza and pneumonia. Uh, the patient for Posata, I have had the case or two, maybe two cases with uh, uh, Posatella. The patient must be thirstless. They must have a dry mouth without thirst. It's a key. It's a key note of the remedy. If they don't have this, forget it. If they don't. Not the dry mouth necessarily, but it's certainly the, if they have thirst, forget it. Sometimes, though, you have to be careful because the patient can be thirsty because they're told to drink or they think they have to drink. But you say, listen, if it was not about telling yourself you need to drink, how much would you drink in a day? Mm, not really. I won't drink at all. Ah, oh, okay. That means the patient is thirstless. Then you say, how is your tongue? And they will say, Oh, it's quite dry right now. And say, so, how's your thirst? Mm, I'm not thirsty. So it's a dry mouth without thirst. And this is a typical case. And the room temperature must be, is also a decisive factor. We've talked about that. The, the disposition of the patient. And it is one of the remedy with loss of taste and smell. So I bet the people that need Pasatella chronically, which is a certain uh, proportion of population, if they come in contact and they're young and vigorous person, if they come in contact with the with the the uh, this this uh, virus, they may lose. They may be candidate to lose smell and taste. I I, I predict that. <clears throat> Rootstocks. I don't see it in this epidemic, but it's often used uh, in in serious case of uh, disease. Um, Sabadilla could be interesting, um, especially for uh, the cough. Um, and the, not so much, yeah, it may have this, the, 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 the sneezing. Um, it's a terseless remedy, let me just see here. Um, and especially the, the symptom of the throat can be, useful like a skin hanging in the throat but i have not seen in this epidemic it's just for you to know sambucus have used this here uh in the last eight weeks so uh, sambucus could be uh indicated in some case especially children that will have the cough at night they're much more susceptible to develop maybe two cases. i say one but it may be two cases that i've used uh sambucus it's a dry cough they can wake up at night uh um with like apnea they're suffocating very 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 common for this remedy um, yeah, it's especially at night, they have a lot of difficulty uh, with this uh, Sambucus. So I put some information there. Sanguinaria is another remedy that I don't see it in this epidemic, but just for you to know, it's a remedy for flu and so on. And especially for cough that persists for a long time, but it's another remedy that has lost taste and smell in influenza. There you go. And that's why I put it there. Sacrolactic acid could be a remedy for this epidemic, especially 
uh, in people that remain weak for a long time. So here we could say epidemic influenza, especially with violent retching and greater prostration when arsenicum has failed. This is what is strong. Tired feeling with muscular prostration, worse from any exertion. Sore feeling all over. Tired feeling. Uh, I'm not sure who's talking. Maybe it's Farrington. No, it's Greg. I have frequently been astounded by its action in the most violent form of epidemic influenza, particularly in those few rare cases that began with violent, uncomfortable vomiting and retching, and et cetera, et cetera. I don't see it necessarily in this epidemic, but maybe at the end, uh, after, if they don't recover, they remain weak and uh, they have uh, muscle weakness that remains, that would be a possibility to look at. Uh, Senegal, it's also with uh, um, a stitches in the ch in the uh, in the chest also, and um, yeah, the accumulation of tough mucus in the tube because we have this in this epidemic. Uh, they find out that the the uh, lining of the of the chest uh, of the of the lungs and the bronchi are covered with a little coating. And that's what's prevent the exchange of oxygen in the alveol alveoli. So when they intubate somebody and they push air with a respirator, it doesn't make a big difference because it's not the air that is missing, it's the exchange of the air into the, into the tissue. And sticta could be a, a, a remedy that could uh, be considered, no, not stick, I mean, uh, um, Seneca could be considered air. Uh, stick to for is dry cough. Veractrum album, I don't see it indicating this epidemic, but it would be for collapsed state with a characteristic of the cold perspiration on the forehead. It's described, I don't see Belladonna described here, but here it says, you know, in 57, it was the genus Epidemicus, 400 case, and so on. So different epidemic, different presentation. Here it's described. Tuberculinum. This is worth reading. This is by Royal A's, I believe. No, it's Yingling. Even be well, not better, but he's a, a good on that. It says, in pneumonia, the first remedy I think of is Bacillinum. That's what uh, Burnett used to do, unless there's a plain indication for another. Uh, beware that Yingling was a very, very good prescriber. Okay, he's a good, good Animanian. He's the one that wrote the Acquisher's Manual. He says, and in many cases, even where aconitum, brownia, balana, or some other remedy leads in the acute thermal, I find bacillin soon comes in to rapidly finish the attack in a very in, in very many cases. I know that a colleague told me she was using um, tuberculinum and with good result in this epidemic right now. Since I have adopted this plan, Yingling is saying, not me. It is seldom a case goes beyond the first stage. When called in time, the cough loosen up, the pain subside, and the lungs are very, uh, are very rapidly free from the accumulation and inflammation. In all people, it acts like a charm. So very important to know. Most cases are convalescent in less than a week. Of course, I do not mean bacillanum in the is a specific remedy for every case, but in those cases where the indication are not well marked and as a finisher of the case, it is useful. The bovine form of this remedy has had promptly relieved the incident stage of hip joint disease. Okay, but uh, my colleague was using aviary. Aduka, we mentioned it before. This was proven by uh, Royal A's. Other remedies are, this would be uh, more uh, late stage or second to late stage for the persis persisting cough, pneumonia in all people. But as you saw, it did terrible in, I think it was in Italy. I don't see Antimum Tartaricum in this epidemic because um, there's not much mucus. Typically with antimicrobial there's a lot of mucus with little effort to expectorate 
and the patient drowns in their own uh, um, exudation. Is there's a great state of weakness, but I don't see it here with the because there's not much accumulation of uh, mucus. Um, I think we're bromium. I don't see it in this epidemic, but it's good to know. Um, and we mentioned antimonium tire, couple of vegetables. Causticum could be indicated in some case. I don't see it in this epidemic. Simicifuga could be interested in many cases of fever, but not in this epidemic. I look at all the symptoms when I say, like here it says, why it should be, it sh why it should be so overlooked. I do not understand as it has been my most important remedy in all epidemic in the last ten years, epidemic of influenza, but not in the current one. And that was uh, Morgan, a student of um, hearing, conium. Um, uh, there are cases of conium in the current flu-like epidemic right now that have responded well to conium. It was the the, the genus epidemicus of the Chicago epidemic in 1989 and 90. Very common chronic prescription. So I assume the people that need it as a chronic prescription may need it also during the flu. So it's important to know. Uh, our good friend Farrakh Master sent us also Solanum aceticum, so we can look at it a bit more because it's not a familiar one. This remedy was introduced to me when I was reading Mathematica of Dr. Margaret Tyler. Since then, I have used this remedy for the last 40 years with excellent results, especially when the mucus get clogged up into the fine bronchioles, thereby producing adult respiratory distress syndrome, ARD, or ARDS. The symptom that I have added in software radar are the following. So we'll put them in the, in the repertory. So here are the, the remedy for the pneumonia patient. So when you have a case of pneumonia, there will be different stage in pneumonia. So the first stage is the congestion. Aconitum doesn't seem to be indicated in this epidemic, but that would be a common remedy. It's easy to identify aconite. Brownia is also a first stage, second stage, uh, and it could be a late stage too. And the key to uh, uh, Brownia in uh, in pneumonia is the rusty color. If you don't have it, if you have a good case of Brownia of pneumonia and you don't have the rusty color, I would doubt of Brownia because usually I would say nine times out of 10, it would have the rusty color if they have pneumonia, not bronchitis, but pneumonia. So that's very pectonomonic. Um, gelsimium. I don't really see so much gelsimium in this epidemic. I know that it, during the 1918 was very common prescription, but it could be a first stage remedy in some type of pneumonia. Same thing with ferrum fos. I said I don't see it. Veritum veridi. I don't see it in this epidemic. This is very strong and powerful. It, it very very quick onset. It's not happening in this epidemic with a lot of congestion, progress very fast. Then there's the second stage. Bronya we've mentioned above, Veratrum Veridi above, phosphorus. I don't see it in this epidemic. It's a very common second stage. Probably the most common with Bronya is phosphorus. Lycopodium, I don't see it in this epidemic. Very, very common second stage, extremely common. Um, I don't see it in this epidemic because you will tend to have a lot of mucus that will form and it would affect mostly one side. It would go maybe to the other, but especially a lot of one side. This epidemic is both side with not much mucus. So I don't see like a podium. It's just for you to know, to have, especially for people that don't have Mathematica, they can use this document as a basis to treat their patient. So let's look at uh, late stage, which may be needed like this, person from France who was mentioning that in in the nursing home they had 120 patients that were dying and these were in the late stage. So this is the rubric this this uh, colleague would have needed. Inflammation in old people. So this is are the remedy. I mean pneumonia in old people. Pneumonia would collapse. So in our epidemic here, mm, 
Mm, maybe Orsinicum. Not sure about Acanthora. Uh, with Keteral State, uh, again, Arsenicum in a, a late stage. Mm, beryllium, maybe beryllium. Uh, Paralysis of the Lung, beryllium. Here I would go with beryllium and perhaps Arsenicum. It could be also Lachesis in the late, late stage like this. Okay. Couple of veg. Late stage. These are all late stage. I've described the late stage. Arsenicum album with the restlessness. The thirst for small sip. Camphora. Digitalis. I don't see it. This would be for patient with in with heart problem. Old with prune juice expectorations. Very similar to brown in terms of the expectoration. But in patient with heart failure, I've treated people with heart failure many times with digitalis that have pneumonia. They can come out very rapidly. Ferrometallicum, I don't see it in this clinic. Neither, it may be lachesis. It could be indicated in very late stage now. Or crotalis oridus. Crotalis oridus is, is not unusual in when people are about to die. So it, it's, it's a common uh, prescription. Um, and um, some keynote you will have the tongue is out on the respirator you might not see it but i've 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 heard that people that are in a collapsed state of discipline the tongue is is out i've read it in the journal um what else could us you would have a, a starting to have a yellow tinge of the white of the eye and maybe a yellow tinge starting on the skin so that would be very very strong confirmatory so when people are about to die it's a great prescription it works so well. So is opium. Opium is the very, very late stage when the people have um, difficulty breathing and there are comatose state. They may have color in their face, but the, the breathing would be very particular. It's like it's distorious. It could be chin stoke breathing uh, and the, the very characteristic puffing. That means they're, they don't, they're not oxygenating very well is the keynote of this remedy. So if you give it at that stage, whew, people come back to life. It doesn't take time, seconds. Oh, and that's it. After that, we have our references. So very good. So we did a good uh, timing, two and a half hours. So now we'll open the microphone to question. Peter. Okay, Andre, I've got quite a few. We'll, we'll I'm glad you're questions. still there because I, I, yeah. I, I didn't know. I never leave my post. Okay. Uh, Okay, so we'll start from the top. There have been quite a few questions, and we'll uh, go as long as you're tolerant of them. Um, first question, what is the difference between homeotherapeutics and genuine Hahnemannian homeopathy? Okay, well, we'll start with general Hahnemannian homeopathy. Genuine homeopathy is individualized. It's not, you're not, you don't prescribe routinely, like you say, oh, everybody needs a certain remedy that, during this epidemic without having a great number of cases to be able to decide. Uh, it's it's not, nothing to do with routine recipe. It's you take the totality of the case. You say, what is, you organize this totality with the most characteristic symptom on top. So you have the genius, the picture, the genius picture of the, the disease of this patient. And you say, which remedy in the Metamega fits best? And then you prescribe this remedy in the optimal pathology. So that's the genuine Hahnemannian homeopathy, which is strict individualization. Uh, homeotherapeutic is people like Tessier, who was a <clears throat> professor of medicine in Paris. He had his own department at, uh, at Hotel Dieu in Paris in the 1840s and 50s. And he says, I'm going to try homeopathy. I'm going to give a trial to homeopathy with pneumonia, and he used three remedies. He didn't individualize. He gave brownia, if they didn't respond, he gave phosphorus. If they didn't respond, he gave antimum tartaricum, if I recall. It was the three remedy used. So he, did, he didn't discriminate, he didn't take a case, just gave the remedy. So that's called routine prescribing. That's called homeotherapeutic because it's not individualized. He gave the remedy because they had pneumonia. So that's called homeotherapeutic. So his death rate was 7.5, which was much, much better than expectancy, which was 21%, and uh, three times less than his colleagues in, in the area, or even the, in the, at that time, it was, 
there was a lot of uh, colleagues publishing 30% death rate in patients with pneumonia. So he creates a lot of uh, turmoil in the medical society. He was he was expulsed. He couldn't publish. He was he was like an academician, and he was uh, totally extracised. But he was able to bring the death rate. Um, he was able to save about 20 patients out of 100 by doing homeotherapeutics. If he had used pure homeopathy, likely he would have brought the death rate 30 out of 100 would have been would not have died under uh, genuine homeopathy. I think that explains it. One is individualized, the other one is not individualized. And also for pathology, Heinemann taught how to use the pathology. Some uh, homeopaths use only decimal, like one, two, three. So that's not very high. You cannot have a very good success, especially when people are very sick. So that would be a problem. Another problem with homeotherapeutics is sometimes they will use polypharmacy. They will use complex remedy. That's not individualized. That's recipes. So that's homeotherapy. Good result, but not excellent. General homeopathy, excellent result. Okay, next question. Sorry, the questions are coming in rather uh, quickly, so I'm trying to uh, grab them as we as we go. Uh, we probably won't get to all of them. Honestly, there's a very large number, but we'll do our best. Um, okay, next question. Um, you, you've you've given a lot of acronyms today during your presentation. Uh, particularly in the beginning, Andre, uh, people are asking whether you'll define those, uh, whether those will be defined in the handout that's used, uh, that's given us later. I assume it will be. Uh, no, not necessarily. Like COVID, it's an, an acronym. Uh, uh, the RT-PCR is an acronym, but I'm not going to define them. It's These are common things. I think there were, I think it was references. The question came early when you were talking about the historical uh, evidence and NI, you know, NIP, things like well, that. Well, I do explain not... it. If people pay attention, I say the 1918, 1920 influenza pandemic, NIP. And now it's written there. I, I go with the, my cursor. I say NIP. So I do the, the and, and PAA, I went precisely, I say pre-antibiotic allopathy. It's just people are not familiar with those terms and those. Yeah, no, I think, I think just, just to interrupt you and save you time, I think once people go back and listen to the recording, they'll, they'll, right. they'll see all that. Um, one qu person asked, uh, what, what to, does one do in homeopathy if, if a virus has been weaponized or engineered by a foreign power? Can, can homeopathy still uh, be helpful? Well, it's, it's not a question of uh, whether, where it comes from. It's the violence of a virus. It doesn't matter if it was uh, manufactured or it came from another vector. It doesn't matter. It's, it's the violence. Um, homeopathy has a tremendous result with all epidemics, except perhaps AIDS, because AIDS, well, we didn't have time to apply. And one of the things with AIDS was was difficult, as, especially for me when I, I saw my first cases, is we did not know who was infected, so they were asymptomatic, and the we could see the effect just in the blood. They had no symptom. It's only when it was the immune suppression was pronounced that they developed symptom, and then it was to manage these cases. And I treated some case wonderfully with pure AIDS. And I have a patient that I diagnosed in 1992. She's doing quite well uh, today, and this is uh, 27 years later. So no. But uh, this is probably the only epidemic that we didn't um, do better than the conventional medicine. But all the other type of condition, regardless of the virulence of the microorganism, whether it's yellow fever, diphtheria, uh, we, did, we do better than um, conventional medicine. Um, so it doesn't matter the, where it comes from. Our, however, I'll put a footnote here. When you have microorganisms that are resistant to antibiotic, like this, some staphylococcus that are uh, 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 resistant to uh, uh, and streptococcus that are now resistant, some close, some some uh, C. difficile that are resistant to antibiotic. They will tend to be resistant to the immune system, also. So it's more difficult for the immune system to uh, overcome them. And when we treat them with homeopathy, it's a bit more difficult when they are with. Uh, they do have. Uh, um, a strain, they're infected with a strain that is of, um, um, that are that are resistant to um, uh, antimicrobial agent. 
However, I've never seen a case that did not respond. I've seen some really bad cases that were abandoned by conventional medicine. I have one right now. She was told she will never heal. She will never heal from an infection. She was. We saw her in class actually in in uh, June last June in Montreal during the course. Uh, I think it was essential of uh, acute and chronic prescribing. She just putting like green, green purulent mucus, like by the great, great large quantity. I talked to her last week and she says, I don't think I've had any mucus in the last two months. Nothing, no cough, nothing. She, she was told she would be incurable. She will have that the rest of her life. She already had it for 10, 15 years by the time we saw her. She had multiple sclerosis. She came to us with multiple sclerosis because she didn't intend to cure that. I have another patient that has... Um, I forgot what is her, the name of her condition. It's a it's a parasite that she she got from a bird, and uh, does a lung infection, a, a parasitic uh, uh, pneumonia, and was told we'll never get rid of it, ever. She will always have it all life. Now I gave her the remedy, and she's barely has any mucus left now after maybe since November maybe. So barely any mucus, and before she was producing like a large large quantity of purulent mucus, barely any cough. So no. Um, even if it's resistance to antibiotic, even if it's supposed to be incurable, no. With homeopathy, it's a law of nature. If you find the right remedy, you will have a response. People will get better. Uh, that's the beauty of it. And at a very low cost, almost no side effect, and uh, not dangerous for the environment. We're not destroying the environment by collecting the, the, the substance that we need to make the remedy. And the... Um, the, the 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 remedy one is given to the patient and it, let's say if there it's material dose it's excreted in the environment it's not dangerous for the environment compared to all the antibiotic antidepressant hormonal replacement therapy it's all in the environment the fish the algae all of it benefit from this um uh pharma, pharmaceutical um um like they say they say what it called uh friendly casualty Right, all the environment is the friendly casualty of modern medicine. Nothing like this with homeopathy. It's just perfect medicine. I'm predicting that one day homeopathy will be the dominant paradigm, and maybe epidemics is the way to make it dominant to to open the door for that. Right now, the paradigm is materialistic, mechanistic. It's been like this for a long time, and it's very very difficult for society to shift. And maybe you need a pandemic like this to create a big shift. So we'll see. Andre, I'll get you, I'll get you the next question. There are many, many questions, so we, we may need to shorten your responses. Uh, Ocelococcinum is a popular cold flu remedy often used as a preventative or at the initial onset of nonspecific flu or cold-like symptoms. What is your opinion on the use of this remedy at the first signs of feeling unwell or as a preventative? And would you use this remedy potentially, would the use of this remedy potentially skew the acute homeopathic picture at the onset of an acute viral ailment like COVID? Yeah, well, it will be hit and miss. So this is really empirical. So you could try it. You could, don't be surprised if you're not, you don't have it, you don't have it right. Again, the law of similars has to be the, the remedy with the, great, the highest level of similarity. So right now we, the remedy that seems to be the most similar is Brownia. If you do that compared to us with Constantinum, I'm quite sure that Brownia will come on top and maybe nothing will happen with oscillococcinum because if, if it's quite dissimilar to the epidemic, nothing will happen. People will not even be protected except maybe a small minority. We don't know. It's a shot in the dark. So I would rather go with uh, what we know so far of, of Brownia and the symptom presented by the patient. So when I heard about this epidemic in January, I start to look in the literature right away and I start to collect all the cases, all, all the to publish and publish case, clinical case, and I could see right away that Brownia looked like the um, most possible remedy, but there was no cases already treated with homeopathy. That was only in China at first. <clears throat> and it confirms later that flu-like symptoms that happened in the following eight weeks all resemble Brownia, and now we have more and more and more confirmation for Brownia. So a, uh, a remedy like Ocelococcinum will be a shot in the dark. Um, next question, what is your opinion of the, of the uh, possible COVID-19 uh, nosode? We don't know. It's possible. <clears throat> nosode are not always great, so it's not a magic uh, answer. So it has to be experiment, and uh, 
in some epidemic, like variolinum was used to prevent smallpox in some epidemic in some area, like Iowa was very good. In another area, people said it, it didn't prevent anything. So uh, it's a bit of shot in the dark again. So it could be very good in some area and, and others none. And depend also who makes the, the remedy and so on. So I would always go with the most similar remedy of the locality. That's, that's the sure way to, do, to go. Next question, uh, would you give Bryonia to someone with little thirst if many other symptoms match? No, no. Oh, well, it's possible that you may be confused with little thirst and doesn't want to bother to drink. So that's possible. You may be confused. But if the patient says, I'm really not thirsty, it's not because I don't want to move. I'm really not thirsty. Thirstless, possible. If you look in the repertory, if we look in the repertory, we'll find three there for Bryonia being thirstless. <clears throat> Uh, with uh, um, during the the heat, let's say, uh, let me just go to open the repertory, the MMPP complete repertory four point five, and we'll go to stomach. We will look at thirstless during the heat, during the chill. It's not it's there as a one, but you'll see during the heat. Oh, it's there, but uh it's there so it, it could be possible but listen it's not it's, it's not it, it's that's not what we see in practice what we see in practice is very very thirsty during the chill uh here they, they put as a tube and during the heat and by the way look at the before the the before the chills happen what i was telling you before and during the heat look at this uh, Brownia, they're very, very thirsty and um, unquenchable to some degree, but may not drink so much because uh, it will say, like, it will say, let's say, large quantity Brownia, but not often because they don't want to get up to drink. So uh, at long interval, perhaps it depends on the patient, but they have to be thirsty. Next question, uh, what do you think about the use of arsenicum as a homeoprophylactic remedy as it was given in India? I would say it's not the best right now, but like we did in a hospital, I suggest if people are anxious and chilly, yeah, it might be a good preventative. Still, 60% of people have responded to, to Brownian, give Brownian is the most likely. So here in the hospital, we said, okay, thirsty, give Brownian. Thirstless, gelsemium. Anxious, chilly, arsenicum. It might work the best. This might bring very, very good outcome. Another question. Uh, I gave Brian a 30C hourly for three hours to a flu patient. His fever continued to go up and down through the next day. Should I have changed the remedy or continue to give Brionia? They say it, 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 it dropped down until the next day? It, go, it went up and down. Oh. Until the next day. No, oh, no. This this uh, it, this um, flu is very resistant, so you have to be a bit more persistent, a bit more, and maybe up the potency if you see this. But it's not great. You, that maybe maybe you don't have the similar with Brownia, or maybe the pathology is not great, or something might not match. So you would have to um, to study this case. Question. Next question is uh, fasting for febrile patients. Is that true also for children? Everybody, children fast by them on their own. Uh, they will they will not want to have mommy's milk or um, take the, the, yeah. So, but you want to make sure they're well hydrated. You do a bit of hydrotherapy on them and you, you try to give them uh, um, uh, water and that they may take, uh, but they might they may not want to have food. Yes, for children also. You skip one meal, two meals, three meals, it's fine, no problem. Uh, they will do very well. They will recover faster. Next question, how would the remedy be administered to the to the patient on ventilation? It could be any it could be done anywhere. It could be done on the skin by rubbing the skin for 10 15 minutes. You put the remedy in water and you rub a part of the body like the leg or the back, you know, with the remedy. You could apply it to a mucous membrane. Um the eye or the having smell the remedy. I would use maybe just put in water and rub a limb, rub a part of the body with the water. But you need to rub for at least 15 seconds to warm up the the skin. Hahnemann talks about it in 
in the Argonaut 385, 285 paragraph, I think, and uh, 173, and in the chronic disease, that the, the preface to the last edition of the chronic disease uh, in 1838. Next question, have you ever seen a pneumonia patient that had no fever, instead cold temperature of 96? What remedy is more recommended then? Sure. Uh, I, I, did, I do talk in the paper about this, but we didn't cover it. So when you see lower temperature, is usually the, the result of antiparatic. Antiparatic not only lowers the temperature, but will lower the, uh, the thermostat. That means the, the thermostat is turned down, and it stays down, and it could stay forever. I mean, for many, many years after, the thermostat is down. So people have low temperature because they lower the thermostat with their antiparotic. This is well known with uh, aspirin, uh, salicylic acid, and it's also known with Telenol. Look at the literature I put there. I didn't put any literature in aspirin because it's not much used now in uh, febrile patient. But today it's Telenol, so I put most of the literature on Telenol. But during the 1918-1920 uh, flu, uh, the influenza pandemic, the NIP, uh, aspirin was certainly a phenomenon as well. It's documented now that um, a lot of people died because they took aspirin. So not only lower temperature, but increased bleeding. So people that bled from the lungs is because they were uh, take uh, so many of them are taking a lot of aspirin. Would uh, next question would uh, would you suggest that uh, hypertensives on ACE inhibitors stop them during the pandemic? Well, look at the article. While, while, while monitoring their blood pressure. Yeah, look at the article. This was written for the journal um, Nephrology. It's written by nephrologists to nephrologists, and they say, shall we stop it? Because it seems to be very dangerous. What shall we do? That's what the articles say. The best thing is if you know how to lower blood pressure naturally, like the best way is, is clearly water fasting. Water fasting, the blood pressure in essential, like uh, uh, secondary, uh, uh, no, primary blood pressure, um, the blood pressure drops very, very quickly, and you, it's easy to bring it down. The best treatment that has been documented to, to uh, manage high blood pressure, um, essential high blood pressure, is clearly water fasting. Very well documented. I have made, I had class on this before, and I've shown it. It's, it's no doubt. Uh, the the results are phenomenal. Another next question: Can you make a comment uh, or offer any uh, thoughts on the use of hydrotherapy in fever, hot water only? Sure. No cold. Sure, sure. So the, the idea with hydrotherapy is more like calorotherapy. You use temperature to move the blood around. So when when people have a high uh, temperature, the higher is the temperature, the more you will have tend to have congestion. So what you want to do is move the blood. The more the blood moves, the more there's healing. The way you move the blood is with hot and cold. A simple procedure, I kind of teach you how to do it because it could be a bit complicated, but like a simple procedure in a child or even an adult that has a fever, is you take a pair of thin cotton socks, you put in cold water from the sink. Water from the sink around the world is the same temperature if the water travels from a pipe from underground. The temperature on the ground after four feet is f is 55 degrees centigrade uh, Fahrenheit all around the, the world or about, mm, let's say, um, 13 degrees, I, I believe, like, yeah, about 12.5 uh, degrees centigrade. So that's universal, the temperature. So you wet your socks with cold water, a thin cotton sock. You wring them well so they don't uh, drip. You put them on. If the feet is cold, you warm up the feet first in water, in hot water, or you can rub them to warm up the feet. You put them on, and then you pair, take a pair, pair of thick, dry wool socks. You cover them completely. You make sure that the, the wet socks don't come out, and you cover completely, and the person goes under the covers, and what happens is the body doesn't like cold, wet on their feet. Nobody likes it, but because the body is warmer than the socks, it will start to warm up the socks, the wet socks, and because there's wool, the wool, the heat will ap, uh, accumulate, and it will take one to four hours to dry. If person has a, a forty degree, one hundred four temperature fever, it will take maybe one hour to dry. If somebody has a, a hundred one fever, it will take maybe 
three, four hours to dry. So it depends. When it's dry, you do it again. But as long as they're wet, the circulation is activated. And wherever is the congestion, the ear, like ear infection, or it's in the head, or it's in the in the chest and pneumonia, uh, the the uh, while the person is sleeping, they're being treated. If the the socks dries up, you do not you do another application. So this is a very simple but a small part of the body. To do a bigger application, let's say for the chest in somebody with pneumonia, you have to be a bit more skilled and knowledgeable. But like a, a one that people could perhaps do if somebody has a very high fever with pneumonia, is you take your undershirt, you put it in cold water, you wring it well, put it on, same principle. Unless the person has a lot of chills. If the person has a lot of chills, warm them up first. You put the shirt on. You put maybe a cotton shirt, long sleeve cotton shirt on top. And then you put a, a wool uh, sweater that covers all the air from coming in and very tucked in. And the person goes on the blanket as long as the shirt is wet. And it has to be a nice tucked shirt, not no hair in between. So it, there's a lot of way of doing it well, and there's a lot of way of not doing it well. And if the patient is uh, it's well done, the patient, it will activate the circulation specifically all around the lungs. And, and it, the, it will accelerate the healing dramatically in patients with pneumonia. I, can, I cannot imagine a person with pneumonia dying with hydrotherapy. But it's much easier to do with homeopathy because you can do it on the phone. You can, you don't need to be there in person, uh, and you don't, you don't need to have all the application. But sometimes, patients don't have remedies, so you have to use hydrotherapy. Next question, Andre, is uh, uh, a uh, uh, one of the participants asked you to address severe lung scarring. Once healed from lifelong repeated pneumonia and lifelong repeated bronchitis illnesses, uh, a, a sucking hole left in lung of a 45-year-old female after healing from COVID-19, multiple patients with this severe scarring, which is now causing dangerous susceptibility to COVID-19. I think they're asking generally, you know, how do how do you manage the case of somebody who's who does have severe lung scarring from pneumonia and uh, repeated bronchitis? The totality of the symptom, you say what's most peculiar about this case, you prescribe the most similar remedy in the optimal pathology, and you should have good result. For instance, <clears throat> I think in December, uh, an old patient of mine, I say old because he's like maybe 85, I treated him in 2007 for, he had, he, was, he had been diagnosed with Alzheimer by three different uh, set of clinician clinics that specialize in Alzheimer. He was a university professor. I treated him for about two and a half years, and I didn't hear from him for another uh, nine years about. So uh, he went back to his profession to teach, and he's very well known and so on. So he continued to teach, and in December, they call me, and he says he has emphysema. And uh, they told him he was, he is incurable. He has is on oxygen, and he cannot walk more than a few minutes. Uh, not even a few minutes. I think it's twenty steps. I said, "Don't worry. It's you can treat that." I mean, it's people should you should be able to recover. But I was glad that he gave me the case this time in two thousand and nineteen, December two thousand nineteen, because when I took his case in actually December two thousand seven, it was in front of the class actually in Toronto. I did this case. Um, he didn't give me many symptoms. It was his wife because he was so much confused and lost. Now he's like, his mind is completely there. In any case, um, I would say by mid-February, uh, he was completely free from oxygen. He could walk easily uh, two kilometers in one shot and without needing to stop. So he met now as he became functional. But they told him that his lung will never heal because it is fibrosis, it is tissue damage, and it will never return. But I told, I explained to him, and he thought it was a good explanation, because I thought at first he, he was doubtful, what I was telling him, because the big guys that told him it will never heal, I said, listen, there's a part of your tissue, or will never come back, but there's a part of your tissue that are still there, but are not very functional. If you could make these tissue that are not very functional more functional, you will you'll start to gain more function and you will have more breathing capacity. And exactly what happened is he has more breathing capacity because he doesn't need to use his oxygen and he can walk at least two kilometers in one shot.
Peter, did I lose you? I was muted for a second. I apologize. So uh, next question is, how similar uh, do you believe the symptoms of the great pandemic are of 18, 1918 through 20 to, to what we're seeing now? No, different. Every every epidemic is different, and this one is 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 different than the 1918, uh, the Spanish flu. Completely different picture, and we're going to have a different set of remedy. But it's possible a different set of remedy, especially. Um, um, well, there are some similarity in terms of people are very sick and they fall they fall sick very quickly, but the presentation seem a bit different. So there are similarity maybe in the early stage, but it seems different in the later stage. In the later stage, in uh, 1918, 1919, is there was a lot of bleeding, there was a lot of black deaths and so on. Now we don't see that; we just see uh, fibrosis of the lungs. Next question uh, for people who did not take a remedy. And are recovering from COVID with lingering sequelae, does do you recommend a remedy and at what potency? The potency must be individualized, which the remedy must be individualized. You take the symptom of the patient, you take in consideration their chronic case. Now you'll have to take in consideration their chronic case, and you prescribe the remedy in the optimal pathology. If you're not sure, you could start with one dose of the 30. If the patient has a very strong reaction, that means two. two to uh, the patient is too sensitive to the potency, so you'll have to go down the potency or dilute the remedy. So you can dilute the remedy in water and give it just one drop. If that's too strong, break the drops. Make it smaller than a drop. Okay, next question. Sorry, you gotta go back to, I'm still recording questions, they're still coming in. Uh, do you have a list of remedies, uh, of the remedies that were in uh, with potencies that were in that kit you showed everyone? Uh, the, those were either 200 or, or 10M. And do you have a list of the remedies that are in, in a kit that anybody should carry around? Because you mentioned if we could distribute them around the world. Uh, well, you could have different kits. You could have different kits. You could have like two kits, one general purpose. And if we if we want to address um, influenza and pneumonia, we would have one specifically for influenza and pneumonia, all the remedies there. But general purpose would include uh, remedy for contusion and injuries, uh, like all type of accident, burn, burns and uh, and strain and sprain and and uh, uh, mental emotional problem. Like say people are in shock or grief, you would need all those remedies. And the another one could be um, do be used for uh, pneumonia. That's the project. However, you could have a bigger kit. No, you just, the box can be just a bit bigger. We have some here in the office. I could get one, but we'll lose time. It's just a bit bigger, and it's contained 100 remedies. So here you could have 50 remedies for, to address influenza and pneumonia, and you could have 50 others to address the general concerns of the patient. Next question, uh, what is the difference between Lobelia perp and Lobelia inflata? Yeah, two different remedies. There's a lot of similarity. Both affects the lungs, both uh, great weakness, both the, the coughing, but if you look the uh, the 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 the, uh, the the weakness is the prostration is much more pronounced and the affection of the lung seems to be more pronounced also so it's really there there's a lot of similarity but a lot of um, uh, more specific preference is more specific very specific actually for our epidemic like next question would simultaneous would simultaneous use of supplements Medications or herbs affect the action of a remedy? No, no, unless the person is extremely sensitive. But if person is very sick and you use herb, it will be make no difference. Next question. If patient doesn't drink the whole day but does a lot in the evening, could they be a pulsatilla patient? Per perhaps, possibly. Um, let me, I think pulsatilla is thirsty at night, can be thirsty at night. So it depends when is the evening here. Let's look evening. Um, Pasta is a one, but if we look at night, uh, no, it's still a one. So it can be, Pasta can be more thirsty at night, actually. Uh, but it's not strong. It's never seen it. It is very rare it would be like this. So don't pay too much, put strength on that. Next question. A nurse who saw many cases from Kirkland, Washington uh, nursing home, where there was really the sort of first hotspot, 
and after in the hospital said all patients had great discoloration around red discoloration around the eyes, like red eye shadow. Right. I saw Has that. Andre heard or seen this characteristic symptom? And so what remedy would be considered? Yeah, I, I, I heard about it, but it's not well described in the literature. So I couldn't make and I didn't know what's the percentage. I know it's described. Uh, here, maybe whoever asked the question could uh, tell me how many, what's the percentage of patients they saw this. So we can look. The way you would look, it would be here. It would not be on the red, by the way. It would be, it would be on the bluish around the eye because that's where it's all put in. But then we can look at, like circle around the eyes. That's what we're talking about. And uh, so th this would be like bluish circle. If we look at red, there are, I think, some, but it's a very small rubric. But the one in red are found in the, uh, in the other one, like see, uh, about the eye. So um, this is very interesting. I would like the person to write me and tell me what's the percentage of people that have this that are recovering. I wouldn't say it's a keynote, though. Uh, it might be, might be a sign of uh, low... Um, um uh, oxygenation saturation index anyway so it's something to pay attention to but uh, i'm not sure if it will be very useful clinically okay let's see um many of the symptoms uh, seem like they would take time to develop should you treat the early symptoms, which may be uh, more innocuous with any salient or unusual symptoms, uh, you know, sort of simple cold, or, or wait for more clear definitive symptoms to present before treatment? It doesn't matter. It depends the, the circumstances of the patient. If the patient is leaving for a trip to, uh, to China, you may want to treat them before they arrive in China. So it depends on the circumstances of the patient. So sometimes you would have to have a judge, judgment call and say, okay, we'll wait a bit longer and see what happened. Or you can give them the chronic remedy. So that's the best strategy. If you're not sure, give the chronic remedy first. 50% of acute, will the patient will respond to the chronic remedy and that's it. It's finished. So if it's not their chronic remedy, then they will develop. The, what, by giving the chronic remedy, it might precipitate or will likely precipitate the acute state, a better picture of the acute state. And very quickly, you know the, the remedy of the acute state. So it's always individualized. You individualize the circumstances of the patient if you want to do it now or later, if you know the, the chronic remedy of the patient or not. So, yes, you, you individualize the case and you make a judgment call. Next question for sensitive respiratory uh, I guess patients, because of mold exposure and environmental toxicity, would you use beryllium as a prophylaxis, propo prophylaxis and perhaps weekly now? Question mark. Maybe not. For okay. for mold related to lung disease with mold, the Burnett has shown that uh, people living in moldy environment uh, they were protected or respond very well to tuberculinum. So that would be something to consider. Our Irene Sebastian, our colleague from um, New Orleans, has worked a lot in, in the last 10 years since Katrina, the, the flood. Many, many people have um, mold in their house, and she worked a lot, and she published on it. Uh, um, her experience in hundreds of cases with Nux Moschata. So Nux Moschata would have to be considered for people that are poisoned with uh, mold, strongly considered. I have, a, I have had good experience with it, too. Not not like Irene. Irene is uh, hundreds of patients, but um, to help the to help heal the the lungs, you would, you would give the similimum, the chronic remedy of the patient. You may consider uh, tuberculinum also to help um, remove the susceptibility and maybe help to heal the lungs. Next question: What about treating the staff in hospitals for exhaustion, uh, feeling overwhelmed, loss of sleep, high stress? Uh, have you thoughts on that? Well. It would be the 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 the, uh, the chronic remedy of the person. If you don't know the chronic remedy of the person, you could consider two remedies, I would say. If it's emotional stress, that people are very on the verge of crying because um, of the, the, the what they're seeing. Like, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, one of our listeners right now or one of uh, our colleagues told me this week that she's an anesthesiologist in a hospital uh, outside of New York City. And she said that uh, an orderly came in with rolling a patient in the surgical room, the operating room, and she had no mask. 
she has a sniffle and coughing and the the our colleague the neurologist says uh, what are you doing here uh, sniffing and coughing and she says you better go get uh, tested for covid and um, and don't come back until we get the result of the test so the test believe it or not took one week to come back so she was at home the patient was at home but it took still one week to come back it was positive but during that day which was monday two weeks ago two weeks from uh, like 12 days ago um she had moved without a mask um 30 about 30 patients to the operating room so imagine how many people were in contact with this patient that was positive and was sniffling and coughing without masks because that hospital ran out of mask believe it or not in america hospital have no mask uh, surgeons and anesthesiologists have to keep the same mask as the, the the one they used yesterday but after a while they they have no more masks so um yeah um so as andre as a follow-up to that would would you uh would it be generally advisable uh in the okay so okay two remedies if it's if the stress is emotional uh like uh emotionally like on the verge of crying i would say ignatia would be a great remedy that would be a, a very good uh prescription if it's really nervous exhaustion like they, they have done too much uh, likely califas would help them and as a follow on that given what you've told uh the um during the presentation what you said during the presentation would would it be advisable do you think for physicians and nursing and frontline uh uh healthcare workers to be taking brownia prophylactically at this point sure and like i said like we did a hospital in michigan i suggest brownia for the thirsty just even for the the le less the, the thirstless and our second album for the chili and 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 cool patient if you don't know just give brownia next question for someone new to homeopathy would it be okay for healthy people to give all four top prophylactics maybe one at a time each few days apart sure it's possible but be careful you could do a lot of proving this way and it may be overdoing it uh look what's look what's in your area and use those remedy in that area or the area of the patient i would say use the remedy that you think is the best Heinemann used to say you know you could give camphora and alternate with cuprum like first and second stage of the remedy he never used veratrum though as a preventative so that would be a late, later stage of the remedy so yes you could use two remedies to, for prevention one week and the other week but not maybe every three days but people that are exposed like in the hospital staff that are exposed daily to covid uh, patient yeah you could do it maybe every five days uh uh do you ever alternate uh, different remedies during uh, treatment in other words do you go from aconite to pulsatilla to sulfur to you know in some sort of rotation the, the only time that i will alternate is when people have two condition so let's say somebody has cancer of the breast and they have a lot of pain and cancer of the breast and they lost their mother so the, the the they lost their mother and they have a very big grief i give the remedy for the breast it doesn't help anymore i give ignatia the patient is better but the breast is not better so i have to give the remedy for the pain of the breast or the general cancer state but when i do this the grief comes back so i say when you feel grief you take ignatia when you when you have the, the, the cancer pain coming back you take the other remedy so, and patient do that back poop, poop, poop. Arneman taught that he says when you have two miasm in the patient an acute and a chronic or two chronic sora with uh, psychosis he says give one and then when the other one rise, give the other one, and you go back and forth. Heinemann did the same thing during the typhus epidemic. He used two remedy, um, Rustox and Brownia, depending if the patient wanted to move or didn't want to move, he used one or the other. And when they switched to the other moving, he would say, when you want to move, give take Rustox. When you don't want to move, take Brownia. This is the epidemic. He had no death out of 183 patients. Next question, a person with uh, COPD, uh, would they respond to homeopathy even though their lungs are compromised? You sort yeah. of spoke to that a bit, but. COPD are compromised. This patient I was mentioning before, right. was on oxygen and could barely walk on oxygen more than 20 feet. Was puffing after 20 feet with the oxygen tank. Now a patient walks two kilometers on the beach, with, which is more difficult on the beach because of the sand, 
sometimes with heels they go and and goes up the heels and uh, doesn't need to stop so that means the lungs are more functional despite the fact that it's incurable according to the diagnosis that he got it will never cure it next question if a patient does not get covid or does not uh well you know i guess i'll just stay with the question uh, because they had been given homeopathic prophylaxis, will they remain at risk as the prophylaxis wears off or even the next wave? We don't know. This is a good question. If you give a prophylactic remedy to a person, do they get, stay immune or how long they stay immune? We don't know exactly, but experience seems to show that they'll be immune at least for the epidemic. And like in the 2018-2020 epidemic, when people did that, well, they would retake, retake the, the remedy during the epidemic. So uh, they don't, there's not really reports of people getting sick after having taken a remedy for prevention. However, it would be interesting to see if they have um, come in contact with the virus with antibodies. So that would be interesting to do. This would be a very good, good, good study to do to see people that um, got the remedy but did not develop the disease. Um, what is the uh, antibody level compared to the one that got the virus, didn't develop symptom, and what's their antibodies level? Would it be better with homeopathy, worse with homeopathy? Would one last longer? And how is it compared to the people that actually develop an active uh, condition and recovered? So those for sure will have a good antibody load for a long time, but they may also have damaged lungs. I would recommend actually to people to, everybody should, that is in relatively good health, doesn't have a comorbidity, should try to be in contact with the virus to some degree. It would be personal, um, personal decision, but it might not be an unwise decision to develop a mild infection, especially with homeopathy. You can come out of it fairly quickly. Uh, for That would be really individualized to the more healthy um, portion of the population with no comorbidity. And if somebody does it, that's just, well, at least you have an advantage over everybody is you have natural immunity from now on, probably for the rest of your life, which is very good because coronavirus will be around us for a long, long time. And that's not the only one. Okay, we're getting towards the end of the, I'm gonna just do a quick skim of the, uh, because some have come in as I've been entering them. Uh, see if there's anything that I wanna grab real quick. Uh, so a number of people are asking, uh, and I, I, um, yeah, a number of people are asking if there's any effort underway to uh, uh, centralize cases of COVID-19 so that the community can learn from the experience of others uh, in the field. Yes, Peter, you answer that one. Uh, so the American. Uh, Institute for Homeopathy is, has organized a large-scale international data collection effort, uh, and we are inviting well-trained homeopaths to uh, submit their cases to that database. To do so, people have to uh, email me. It's a very secure database for obvious reasons. Uh, so folks will have to email me, and God forbid a tsunami will probably come my way, having said this, uh, email me uh, with the request to be added. I, I don't want to add people to the project who are just seeking to hear results. I'm only looking for folks that are willing to submit cases to it, and they need to just email me, uh, uh, list their credentials, and I will uh, do my best to quickly add them, give them uh, uh, access to the database so they can add cases. Um, uh, I'll do that as quickly as I can. My email address is peter underscore gold, G-O-L-D, at gold, G-O-L-D, O-R-L-U-K dot com. So peter underscore gold at goldorlick.com. There are about 800 people on this currently listening, so if it takes me a few days to get back to you with your login uh, authorization, uh, please be charitable with your thoughts. And, and I'd like to also add this, the, uh, two more things at the, at the very least. 
in Germany, they do have, um, there might be other groups, but I know in Germany, uh, in Austria, there's a group of uh, German speaking uh, homeopaths that are also collecting cases and they will share it with us. And I'm sure like the Italians and so on will, will participate in the French. And the yes, to that end, actually, the the AIH project, we are in close contact with uh, different groups in Belgium, the Netherlands, France, uh, Italy, uh, Spain, India, and elsewhere, uh, Brazil, and elsewhere. Uh, we're all talking to one another. We're all sharing data. So it really doesn't matter if you have a, a some place you'd rather deposit your information. Uh, please feel free. Uh, uh, ours is open to folks who who want to contribute to it, but there are there are to Andre's good point. There are many people collecting uh, cases, and we're trying to all work together to share that information. Yeah, this is the time of homeopathy. Another thing that I didn't mention. There's many things I did not mention, so maybe I'll, I'll write something at the end after the webinar. But one is maybe people will look to obtain Lobelia preference. Not many pharmacies have it. I think no laboratories in the United States carry it. Is that correct, Peter? Correct. Okay. We've, 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 not found, we've not found any. Uh, Remedia in, uh, in Europe is the only one that anybody's identified as a reliable source. No, uh, there's Ensward. Ensward, the, uh, Ensward as well. Yeah, Ensward has it. And uh, Remedia. So you have two sources, one in Britain. And Ensward is very good for uh, sending to North America. But unfortunately, Remedia doesn't ship to the to, to United States. They ship to Canada, but not the United States. The FDA told them not to ship anymore. So uh, if you want the remedy, you could order from, from Remedia, but you will have to ship it someplace else, like another, a friend, like in another country, and they would ship it to you, or um, order it from Ensworth. Ensworth has a very good track record. Usually it's five days, working days, to have the, the remedy at, at your place. So that's probably your best. We do have it here. We have it uh, to the 30. We will look for the other ones. As for beryllium, it might be difficult also to find. We have all kinds of beryllium here. We have like maybe 20, 30 different potency of beryllium up to the mm. Uh, I'm just looking through to see if any of you have come in in the last moment before I... Uh, one uh, participant is asking if you consider giving beryllium to prophylactic as prophylaxis for pneumonia. I think you spoke to that earlier. Yeah, it, it could be an interesting remedy um, uh, to use as a preventative for people that already have a, a long fibrosis, let's say. It could be therapeutic and preventative for those people. Um, yeah, so that would be uh, something that is possible. Also, one thing we didn't talk about is this is this webinar is recorded. So for people that you, you know others that would like to listen to it or we have 1,500 subscriber registrant for this webinar, maybe 700 made it, which is typical. So just be aware and tell your friends and so on that may have missed it or have registered. It's recorded and it will be available to listen on the website of the Keynesian Academy. So later today, it will be there available to listen to. So anybody can, um, can uh, view it uh, freely forever, uh, forever, for as long as it's uh, pertinent. Yeah, I'm just again scanning real quickly because I've had a few more come in since you started that one. Um, by the okay, way, so, by so the way, uh, behind me, behind me here is Lipe and Anaman. They're watching very carefully what we're doing. Yes, they they we've noticed. Um, how will uh, your slides, presentation materials, Andre? How will you communicate those to uh, people who have participated in today? Uh, the slides, yeah, I would I would uh, share them. Um, I will put it on the website, and the paper, the 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 word, um, I will put on the website. But you know what? I'm gonna do hyperlink. Now is I will. You have the table of content, and people will be able to press on the table of content to go to different part of the. Uh, of the content and also for the remedy, I'll hyperlink them and maybe organize them a bit better and then put in a PDF form. So like this, uh, they can, it cannot be lost, so it will be fixed, but a PDF that is uh, OCR that you can recognize the character. We'll put, we'll put it on the website maybe tomorrow. I'll have to work a bit. I need a couple hours to work to make it a bit better. 
I think that there are a, a number of additional questions. Many of them are repetitive from what we've talked about. So I think we've I think we've kind of reached the end. Andre, many many are are thanking you for your uh, wonderful presentation, the thoroughness of it. Um, I could go on and on, but you're you're getting many many uh, thanks from uh, participants. And thank thank you from all of us. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Peter for uh, being so kind to help me out. And yes, listen, we're a community where you have to work uh, tightly and we have to communicate with each other, our failure and our, our positive result. And uh, on behalf, they will ra rise to the situation and we can do it as a group. So we have to work together and communicate your case uh, to, to Peter. Uh, we will try to document as much as possible what we're doing. Uh, some people like uh, will be working with dying, like we have, we have heard today. And other people will work on the on the front line with uh, for prevention, but all should uh, should try to document what you're doing and report the good case and so on. And the more evidence we have, the more we will uh, be able to do document it for future generation. Excellent. I think we can close on, on that note. Okay. So all have a good evening, morning, or afternoon wherever you are in the world, and. Uh, if there's a need, we could do another webinar in the future if in one month, two months, if we find out that there's a need to do it. But right now, it's at the beginning of the epidemic. The epidemic could change. The remedy that I mentioned today, the the brownia, the uh, the um, lobelia purpurans, the beryllium should be our the remedy we should look at most. And uh, report your success, report your failure, but always try to apply the strict individualization to have success. Otherwise, if you have failure, you, you'll look back, you'll see, I didn't individualize the case. I did it routinely. Okay, very good. So I'll have uh, a good uh, um, uh, rest of the day and um, we'll keep in touch and uh, for the success of homeopathy and for the, the end result is the benefit uh, to humanity. Bye-bye. Thank you, Andre. Thank you.